the speakers have already joined us our principal madam dr shoma ghosh she is also with us at first i would request our principal madam to formally welcome our honorable chairperson and the distinguished speakers madam over to you please with a population of about 1.2 billion as per 2011 census india is likely to be the most populous country on this planet by 2030 with 1.6 billion people approximately it currently accounts for more than 17% of the global population thus ensuring healthy life ensuring education for all is really a challenge for india this challenge is more severe in all the countries of asia africa and latin america because of discrepancies along the lines of caste creed race religion and more specifically economic and financial status we need to have a world in which every woman child and adolescent in every setting realize their rights to physical and mental health and well-being education has social and economic opportunities and is able to participate fully in shaping prosperous and sustainable societies this intersectionality is really a challenge not only in our country but also the countries of our countries of developing world and today in the day second day of icssr sponsored webinar we are having with us dr indranil acharyo professor of english vidyasagar university professor dr piyali shur professor and head department of sociology jadavpur university mr deep purokayasto senior executive director prajo non profit organization who under the chairmanship of dr aniruddha choudhury former associate professor hiralal mazumdar memorial college for women dokhineshwar are going to enlighten us regarding this problem and prospects for future development with that brief note and enormous gratitude and thanks to all the speakers and the chairperson i'd like to hand it over to the department of sociology and english for further proceeding thank you thank you madam for this warm uh, welcome address today uh, we are going to discuss in some newer ways the wide topic of childhood and intersectionality yesterday we had with us several distinguished speakers they have already thrown interesting kinds of knowledgeable rays on different levels of intersectionality considering childhood issues today also we have with us distinguished speakers from different fields such as literature sociology history and others in terms of literature childhood has been viewed in different ways it can be the imaginary pristine quality oriented sectionality in itself at the same time it can be a fraught area of the so called adult conflicts to be recaptured within the level of childliness so we are going to hear today so many ideas cross crossings of ideas concepts and viewpoints uh, we are very eagerly waiting for the valuable talks to be delivered by our distinguished speakers 
we would like to invite our honorable chairperson professor aniruddha choudhury uh, to chair today's session he is a very renowned scholar in his field and uh, as our principal madam had already said uh, he was the former teacher in charge of our college sir we are uh, privileged to have you with us uh, please come forward and uh, honor the position of the chairperson over to you sir uh, good afternoon everybody uh, uh, thanks particularly uh, pritha pritha kundu and uh, principal ma'am uh, particularly uh, today uh, we have three distinguished speaker invited speaker in first phase and after that uh, we have five uh, paper presenters so a tight schedule uh, uh, you know very well that uh, this is a icssr sponsored uh, seminar uh, it has been i think scheduled in uh, mid march uh, but uh, for this uh, covid situation it has to be postponed and now the topic is same but the topic is more relevant today when we are talking about childhood and uh, intersectionality in indian context uh, so uh, we should not delay uh, we should go straight uh, first in our first in our invited speakers Uh, particularly in uh, indoni lacharjo from the department of english uh, vidyasagar university professor piali shur uh, head of the department sociology jadavpur university and uh, professor uh, not uh, he is i think development expert the name is you know uh, mr deep purokayastho executive director prajak a non profit organization a renowned non profit organization uh, so uh, we should not delay so uh, before handing over uh, to professor uh, our first speaker professor indroni lacharjo uh, i would like to request Sharbojoya Banerji, faculty member of the English Department of Hiralal Mojumdar College, to give a brief review, uh, you know, uh, brief introduction of Professor Acharya before I handing over mic to him. Uh, in this context, also uh, after completion of talk by Professor Acharya. we would like to take uh, like to invite questions from the audience because professor acharya has to leave this webinar for some urgent reasons so uh, sharbojoya please introduce first and then i will hand over to professor acharya uh, sir uh, this is chandra boli may i please interrupt for a while yes yes sir yes is yes, a uh, actually uh, our faculty member from sociology winrila dotto uh, she is actually uh, introducing you oh. not only as the former associate professor or not as uh, only the uh, former uh, teacher in charge but uh, oh. she will just introduce you as our uh, today's chairperson so may 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 i please be uh, uh, yes. given the chance of introducing winrila Yes, thank you, sir. Ongela, yes, please introduce, uh, sir. Ongela, please come forward and introduce, sir. Yes, Chandra Bhuji. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I would like to introduce uh, our today's chairperson, Dr. Anirudh Choudhury, former associate professor of Department of Sociology, Hiralal Majumdar Memorial College for Women, and also former teacher in charge of this college. currently dr choudhury is the member of ug board of studies department of sociology west bengal state university 
he has worked as a guest professor of calcutta presidency robindo bharati bardwan and west bengal state university and as a faculty member of ias training center of presidency college he is also one of the founders of sociological association of west bengal and associated with a number of academic and social organizations dr choudhury participated as a chairman or speaker of various international and national seminars and colloquium and written or edited a number of text and other books now over to you sir okay sarvajaya now this is your part please introduce professor acharya Uh, yes, yeah, sir. Um, uh, good uh, good afternoon to all of you here, and uh, our sincere thanks to you, sir, to Dr. Anirudh Choudhury, our very beloved Anirudh sir, for gracing this occasion with his presence. So, as already mentioned by Dr. Choudhury, we are really honoured to have here with us today, Professor Dr. Indranil Acharya, former head of the Department of English. Vidyasagar University West Bengal Dr Acharya was the deputy coordinator of the UGC SAP program in the Department of English from 2009 to 2014 He has been the state coordinator of the People's Linguistic Survey of India since 2009 His field of work primarily involves documentation and translation of the oral and folk literature and study of languages of the dalit and tribal communities in west bengal he is the author editor and translator of a large number of books journals and research papers such as towards social change essays on dalit literature listen to the flames texts and readings from the margins and languages of bengal just to mention a few so i would now like to request our honorable guest speaker dr indranil acharya to give his valuable observations on today's topic and enrich us with his inputs over to dr acharya thank you ma'am for your kind introduction and am i audible uh, to everybody okay yes sir it's fine so at the outset uh, i would like to uh, thank the management the principal and the two departments of your college department of sociology and english for inviting me to this uh, three day national iccsr sponsored seminar now it's a webinar and uh, i was uh, requested by pritha dr pritha kundu uh, way back in i think in february uh, when you were planning uh, to hold uh, a seminar in your college in march unfortunately due to this uh, covid-19 crisis it had to be postponed and uh, uh, today we have met here in an online platform Uh, to conduct that icsr uh, webinar and uh, uh, the title of uh, my presentation today is childhood and intersectionality in the context of indian dalit writing uh, as uh, you must have known from the introduction that uh, i have been working in the domain of documentation translation and analysis of dalit and tribal literary texts of west bengal and the neighboring state Uh, since 2008-9 so uh, we have uh, attempted to analyze uh, and in a way evaluate the the literary linguistic and sociological you know contexts of dalit and tribal literature and uh, in fact uh, in today's talk uh, which is a uh, relatively a brief one as in any webinar in any national webinar it is quite expected that we have limited time so i decided uh, to uh, point 
point out certain areas of intersectionality uh, between uh, the sociological uh, theory of intersectionality and its uh, application in the domain of uh, Dalit and tribal writings. Especially, I have uh, uh, included in my discussion today uh, the very marginalized, in fact, severely marginalized uh, territory of you know, the nomadic and denotified tribes literature. In fact, the autobiographies of uh, some of the authors of the nomadic and denotified tribes. And uh, I have included them broadly under uh, the structure of Dalit experience, but uh, they are uh, also beyond and separate uh, from this, you know, Dalit uh, discourse, uh, because they are even, you know, more marginalized than the the Dalit population of India. Uh, in fact, they are, uh, you know, marginalized people within a broader marginalized group. So this is an example of marginalization within marginalization. Uh, I, I uh, uh, will be referring to certain, you know, uh, theories and certain uh, approaches, certain perceptions uh, about uh, the idea of marginality and uh, the different constructs of marginality and how do they overlap and how do they, in a way, uh, interconnect uh, with some uh, broader dimensions and a very complicated way of experience of living with uh, you know pain and suffering of living with insult and humiliation so the entire dynamics of you know dalit experience the entire dynamics of uh, the experiences of nomadic and denotified tribes okay would be explored by me i would be able to indicate broadly you know the areas of experience as you must have been you know listening to the to the rise of this theory, the idea of intersectionality, how it emerged in connection with the notion of uh, black uh, women's, uh, you know, ideas of uh, rights, you know, how black feminism and the uh, associated civil rights movements, you know, gave rise to this idea and how it was later broadened and, uh, you know, applied to other domains of knowledge as well and how it uh, came to be associated with uh, you know many forms of marginality and today i shall be discussing one such form of marginality which is also inextricably connected with different parameters of marginalization and as i've already mentioned here gender race class and many other factors are uh, are uh, associated with the idea of intersectionality the the notion of interconnectedness the notion of overlapping the notion of very intricate uh, simultaneity of experience uh, experience of uh, diverse ways of life, diverse uh, views of life, and in a way, diverse crisis of life. So how it recognizes the dynamics, the relationships, the connections between different categories of identity. Uh, so we, we discuss all such issues uh, while we discuss uh, the emergence of intersectionality, uh, the growth and development of the notion of intersectionality, uh, its special application, uh, and, and in a way an increased uh, use of the idea of intersectionality in the 21st century in different domains of knowledge. Okay, And uh, if we look back, we know how it originated from the social movements of the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, and uh, I have applied the experience of Dalit movement uh, in this context uh, because, uh, broadly speaking, Dalit movement in India also gained momentum in the 1960s and 1970s, particularly in 1972 with the establishment of the Dalit Panthers, uh, you know, move movement, which was inspired to a large extent by the, you know, Black Panthers movement uh, in the African American context. We find how, you know, it gained momentum and they there were many autobiographies or life writings you know which uh, began to be written at that point of time there were many other forms of narrative as well and how literature was in a way projected as the mouthpiece as the organ of a new kind of social awareness okay, which we experience and witness in the indian context okay the identity politics and uh, what were the determinants which uh, in a way defined you know dalit identity the marginal identity and, 
and how you know different types of discriminatory practices were identified and in a way theorized in order to understand the mechanism the ways of you know working of the marginality discourse a vis a vis the discourse of majoritarianism in the indian social and political context uh, in fact intersectionality allows people to understand you know one another in a broader spectrum you know instead of by one trait in fact uh, i will be referring to uh, some of the you know autobiographies of these nomadic and notified tribe people the authors okay, which would help us to understand how you know these uh, tribes were often you know misunderstood as you know monolithic as unidimensional as they were often identified with one major trait and how the other areas of experience were often overlooked due to ignorance due to lack of engagement closer engagement engagement with the ways of living of these communities and maybe due to a general reluctance to engage with the with the social economic cultural and many other aspects of and living of these uh, critically marginalized groups of the indian subcontinent so uh, from that point of view we find that there are different dimensions of identity which we uh, discover in the uh, autobiographies of these dnt authors and there are many factors we find that contribute to the difficulties in their lives particularly in the is authors narratives and uh, we cannot point out one particular aspect of oppression okay, as the root cause of their suffering because that would lead to misunderstanding of that individual's identity so if we really want to uh, you know understand the authorial point of view the authorial perspective the the pains and sufferings of the author the anguishes of the author the humiliations faced by the author okay in these uh, autobiographies we find that in intersectionality can be a, a very uh, acceptable form of theoretical framework that can uh, that can successfully explain and interpret the the various subtle you know workings of different parameters of uh, you know experience of marginalization okay which would finally you know, finally make their life you know intolerable unbearable okay in a way uh, we find how these erstwhile criminal tribe you know still fight the stigma and poverty uh, in the uh, indian uh, uh, subcontinent in the indian context okay and who were denotified 68 years ago okay on uh, uh, august 31 1952 okay a day which is still celebrated as a liberation day for the denotified and nomadic tribes across india we find that how uh, you know these people are still victims of social stigma and systemic discrimination and how it affects their life and how it marginalizes them on different parameters on several determinants okay which uh, race class gender ethnicity and many other uh, uh, points of marginalization uh, and i quote from one uh, one uh, such dnt uh, scholar you know a phd research scholar uh, from the laman banjara tribe of maharashtra sudam rathore i quote uh, from one of his observations Uh, there is a stereotype against denotified nomadic tribes in police media society and even in some judges every member of this community is considered a criminal by the virtue of birth and the stigma continues till they die so this is something which uh, is difficult to do away with Uh, in fact i refer to one supreme court verdict uh, in march 2019 the supreme court had set aside its own 2009 judgment and set six convicts free who were earlier sent to death row it was the first of its kind ruling they were convicted by multiple courts including the apex court in a famous rape and multiple murder case of nashik district in maharashtra the supreme court said the six men were falsely implicated and roped in by the police all six of them who spent 16 years in jail for a crime they never committed belong to the nomadic tribes for merely declared as born criminals in fact in fact if we look at the history of these denotified tribes we find that they are the tribes who were notified as criminal tribes 
under the Criminal Tribes Act of 1871 by the British colonial government. After decades of facing horrors of this racial act, they were denotified by the government of independent India on 31st August 1952. But the Criminal Tribes Act was repealed only to be replaced by the Habitual Offenders Act. In fact, uh, I referred to one uh, uh, theater of protest, Budhan Theater. Since 1998, Budhan Theater, Budhan was a member of Edia Shabar community in Purulia district of West Bengal. Budhan died in police custody. And Budhan Theater has performed plays to raise awareness about the conditions of many marginalized groups. One of their main goals was to demonstrate that DNTs are not born criminals. They are humans with real emotions, capacities, and aspirations. In fact, the autobiographies that I will be referring to in my talk okay, all bring out this humane aspect of these denotified people. The group was started after noted Bengali author Mahashweta Devi suggested that they make a play on the custodial death of Budhan Shabar in a West Bengal jail. In fact, in 2007, the United Nations Committee on Elimination of Racial Discrimination asked the Indian government to repeal the Habitual Offenders Act and uh, effectively rehabilitate them. In its concluding observation, it expressed concern and stated that, I quote, the so-called denotified and nomadic, which are listed for their alleged criminal tendencies, under the former Criminal Tribes Act of 1871, continue to be stigmatized under the Habitual Offenders Act of 1952. In fact, uh, there is often a need for reservation of these people, but they are very arbitrarily put into different categories of STs and SCs and even OBCs. So it's a huge population of unorganized people you know mostly living on the margins of society you know geographically culturally historically ignored by the mainstream discourses and uh, you'll be surprised to know that this uh, you know dnts you know, the nomadic and denotified tribes constitute almost you know 11 crore people 11 crore people so by the 2011 census we have come to know that they are huge in number and particularly the pandemic situation has also said disaster to their life the the, uh, the very disturbing you know uh, media reports and pictures which we saw uh, during the large you know movement of the migrant laborers from different states okay, if we look into the identity of many of these migrant laborers we would find that okay, many of them belong to these nomadic and denotified tribe but the social stigma, as I've already mentioned, still persists. And in fact, uh, a community, a denotified community, or style criminal tribe, Chara tribe uh, of Gujarat, Ahmedabad, you know, that speaks the Vatu indigenous language, is totally ignored by the government. And, uh, you know, there is one activist of that community, of Chara community, Dakshin Chara, a very young man, a, who, uh, who says, uh, rather laments, uh, uh, within court, I say, I have been successful in getting a number of prestigious national and international awards, but in the eyes of the lowest rank of constable, Dakshin Chara may not be anything more than a criminal. In fact, in this connection, I refer to the first you know, autobiography of the DNT author. Uh, it is uh, entitled in Marathi, it's written in Marathi, Kole uh, Tiache Por. The English translation is Against All Odds, published by Penguin in 2000. And uh, if, you, if you look at this uh, you know, uh, DNT uh, uh, you know, life narrative, autobiography, it's translated from Marathi into English by Sandhya Pandey, uh, originally written in Marathi and published in 1994. It's an autobiography of a, a DNT boy, of a nomadic boy, studying in uh, the fifth grade. Okay, and you would find uh, there is a series of you know, narration of you know, different episodes of violence, insult, and the resultant identity crisis of this fifth grade you know, nomadic boy 
no, desperately trying to continue his study okay, in a village school, but always being forced to pay attention to other you know, aspects of life, always being forced to pay attention to the other urgent, pressing concerns of survival. Okay, and they are elaborately narrated and how there is a necessity of to hide his caste identity, as it also happened in some other Dalit authors, Marathi Dalit authors, like Baburao Bagul, if you read the autobiography of Baburao Bagul, and if you read one story by Baburao Bagul, when I hid my caste, okay, we'll come to know about that. I, I just read out, you know, one or two sections from uh, this autobiography to, uh, to make it clear how, you know, this boy had to uh, had to uh, face different strands of marginalization, how his life was uh, an intersection of different forms of experience of marginalization. Okay, and uh, I quote one, uh, one passage where uh, the boy says that people were rude and insulting to me. Since a young Kolhati boy, Kolhati, you know, was a former criminal tribe, but you know, by tribe. And in Maharashtra and Madhya Pradesh, parts of Madhya Pradesh, these Kolhatis are, are, you know, they are detested and hated by the mainstream people, the upper caste people. And they are suspected as, you know, pilfarats, a thieving community. And look how uh, the boy says that people were rude and insulting to me for his identity. For his identity as a Kulhati boy, obviously could not command any respect from the kind of people who came there. And look how this Kulhati community were also professional entertainers. Okay, they had to entertain people in different jalsas, the folk jalsas, okay, like Tamasha. Okay, in Tamasha, they had to play the role of entertainers. Okay, and how the boy says, I was a delicate looking boy, and some of the men who attended the Tamasha kissed me and touched my private parts deliberately. So look how that this boy was also used for the body of the boy was used for sexual gratification. Okay, look how he had to entertain the, the caste people. Okay, by playing this role, he was forced to play this role. The monotony of the song and dance routine every single evening was terribly boring. And most of all, the sadness and despair of the women behind their laughing facades affected me deeply. Look at the boy narrator's perspective of the pain and suffering and humiliation of the Kolhati women okay, who had to dance there and entertain in the Tamasha. Okay, shows and how they had to play the role of prostitutes. So if you read the uh, you know, autobiography, you will find that there are different layers of you know, marginalization. Even there are you know, other forms of torture, violence, and brutality of high-handedness, which is experienced by the boy narrator even within his own community. Okay, there is one incident where he could earn 100 rupees from one of uh, his stay in the Tamasha performances during the summer vacation. And when he returned home, you know, he couldn't stay uh, with his mother because uh, his mother was a Tamasha artist and she was a prostitute. She used to live with another man okay, and her first husband had forsaken her. And look how that there was an identity crisis for this boy narrator. And he had to stay with his grandparents. But look how he was even abused by his grandfather. Okay, when I, I quote one section from this autobiography, okay, the boy narrator says that I earned money from the Tamasha show. I bought secondhand books for class six and hid the remaining 50 rupees. And then... After a few lines, he says that his grandfather approached him and asked him to give him some money to buy a bottle of country liquor. He was reluctant to give him money because he had a plan to buy books for class six. Look how when he returns from his school in the evening, he finds when he lived through his notebook, he finds that the money was gone. 
and now there was a tremendous anger okay, swelling in his mind accusing anyone of stealing would have invited a beating so i said nothing but anger burned in my heart in the evening ajoba came back with bottles of liquor ajoba is the grandfather aji cooked fish and then sat down to drink aji is the grandmother and then look here the grandmother asked the grandfather where did you get the money to buy this alcohol before ajoba could answer i shouted give my money back you should be ashamed of yourself stealing a child's money grandfathers give money to their grandchildren not steal from them my rage was spilling out and i could not control it those 50 rupees would have taken care of my school expenses for the whole year and i had done all kinds of courts and back breaking work to earn the money at the tamasha show so look how that we find that the boy narrator is not merely a victim of his identity of his kolhati identity he is also a victim of the gluttony of the upper caste men who visit the tamasha okay he is also a victim of the greed of of his own grandfather okay who uh, who doesn't mind you know stealing money the hard earned money of his own grandson for consuming liquor so this is a world you know where we find that the 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 boy narrator has to experience the author has to experience many many unpleasant things in course of his uh, in course of his life but but he had to he had to pursue his study uh, so kishor shantabai kale uh, who actually wrote this autobiography who belonged to this kolhati community uh, was quite frank in uh, in talking about his own experience as a member of this marginalized dnt community and and uh, there were many more episodes in fact uh, in course of this brief uh, lecture it won't be possible for me to uh, dwell on each and every episode because there are different episodes which uh, you know high lighting different forms of uh, oppression okay patriarchal oppression we also find economic oppression we find uh, sexual oppression and there are many types of oppression which are also related to the identity of this erstwhile criminal tribe uh, so i i move on to another uh, you know very important a very significant uh, specimen of dnt autobiography uh, this is uh, called upara upara by lakshman mane Uh, lakshman mane also belong to a uh, uh, tribe a dnt uh, kaikadi kaikadi was an erstwhile erstwhile criminal tribe and they were denotified later and upara in marathi uh, is outsider okay upara how they are you know socially culturally economically you know outsider geographically outsider how they live on the fringes of society and how they uh, have a kind of existential anxiety every day you know how they count on every day of their life as the greatest challenge for their survival and uh, lakshman mane this was translated into english by ak kamat Uh, upara and outsider and uh, it has become a very remarkable kind of you know dalit autobiography and there are uh, there are many many criticism of this uh, work of autobiography uh, highlighting different aspects of you know the experiences of uh, a member of the dnt community and here also we find that uh, there is a boy narrator okay, who studies uh, in the 10th standard and we find uh, uh, different uh, narratives of exploitation uh, in fact gender violence is also seen through a boy's perspective uh, in fact the whole adult world uh, is uh, viewed from the boy narrator's point of view and it is very interesting to know how the the boy narrator encounters the adult world at a very premature stage of his life and uh, how he encounters you know prostitutes gamblers and and people from 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 uh, many other uh, you know walks of life and how he uh, uh, experiences evil you know first hand experience of evil at a very tender age and and look how uh, how his friends his peers you know react in a different way to the experience of evil and uh, and in a way uh, we find how the boy narrator also captures 
the mindset of his own relatives of his own family members to the tragedies uh, in the lives of the upper caste people uh, and how there is a very complex you know intermingling of different types of you know experiences experience of humiliation experience of pain and suffering experience of a kind of uh, you know sympathizing with the sufferings of the upper caste uh, which is uh, which is quite uh, you know paradoxical paradoxical from the point of view of the marginalized uh, but but we find there are many such episodes and incidents uh, which are which are narrated which are narrated in this autobiography the upara by lakshman mane uh, in fact i read out uh, uh, one section because i think that will uh, help the audience to understand the the dynamics of this complex interplay of identities and and interplay of different parameters of uh, marginalization uh, i i say that uh, there was a tragedy in the upper caste family you know the uh, at the uh, on the day of marriage the uh, Uh, the bride is not accepted by the groom's family and there was a there was a case of you know great violence and a great ruckus and what happens that uh, the bride uh, ultimately goes mad she can't accept uh, this uh, tragedy uh, in her life and she commits suicide but when uh, the news of suicide reaches the the family of the, this dnt family because the, the boy narrator's mother was a, a domestic help in that upper caste family so when the news reaches them uh, uh, the boy narrator describes how okay, his mother broke down she remembered many nice things about the girl such as her generosity in giving away leftovers look how the generosity in giving away leftovers now this giving away of leftovers that is dutan Uh, you must have heard of that uh, autobiography by om prakash balmiki entitled jutan this leftover itself is a symbol of you know great humiliation and discriminatory practice uh, which the dalits are often given okay, who are treated almost as uh, you know non humans okay in this manner even that is memorized by the mother Uh, in almost uh, you know in a very nostalgic manner okay how uh, she generously gave away leftover vegetables and the like she got extremely emotional and started sobbing uncontrollably look how in, you know a member of a criminal tribe a woman a mother who is a domestic help who is always treated derisively always given leftovers by the upper caste women he starts sobbing uncontrollably for the suicide of an upper caste young lady as if she had lost a close relative i could not hold back my tears either the boy narrator also start crying with his mother okay and look how the question uh, you know arise in the boy narrator's mind in our community women did marry twice even thrice if a woman was abandoned by her first husband she could take a second one if she wanted to leave her second husband she could even go back to her first husband if she so desired mother explained okay the author quotes we are low caste nomads these things are a way of life for us but not for them for them a woman's honor is as delicate as glassware as delicate as glassware really very difficult to analyze the statement of the boy narrator's mother a a member a woman of the nomadic denotified tribe okay. so uh, we find how uh, in these autobiography there is a very complex interplay of different types of marginalization and yet at the same time there are certain realizations uh, which which completely uh, in a way challenge and contest the the notions you know the fixed traditional notions uh, of binaries you know how there are many overlappings there are many gray areas you know which we can observe in these dalit autobiographies uh, in these uh, dnt autobiographies where, where we find how the author the relatives you know the family members 
you know often react in uh, in a different way in certain situations you know which are unique and which are very we evoke very complex feelings and associations uh, so uh, there are uh, also uh, some other you know narratives some other autobiographies like one uh, a very famous autobiography by another uh, author from another nomadic tribe uh, the title is uchalya in marathi the english rendering is the branded uh, by lakshman gaikwad lakshman gaikwad belong to uh, the bhamta tribe it's an another uh, kind of you know dnt tribe uh, erstwhile criminal tribe in fact uh, if we uh, if we read the branded you know we find how how there had been you know different ways of branding uh these nomadic people you know these banjara people and how you know they were denied food shelter everything the basic amenities of life and how they had to uh, live without food for 7 to 8 days and how they are forced to uh, join uh, into uh, the group of thieving in the group of thieves uh, how uh, they become you know compulsory in the for us you know and how they take up this ignoble profession barely for their survival and it's even you know surprising to find that from such a community there is a boy you know who uh, who desperately attempts to continue his study who is reading at the fourth standard you know is the first person to who have visited the school to attend school and how he he nurtures an ambition uh, to to rise in life you know to give up this profession you know this hereditary profession uh, of thieving and how he wants to join the mainstream how he wants to uh, you know improve his own uh, lot in this society so uh, we find uh, that these autobiographies uh, in a way uh, you know uh, provide a very good example of you know different uh, shades of experience different shades of experience and how they, they uh, how they question and interrogate uh, the notion of you know monolithic homogeneous identity say for the dalit uh, people or even for the nomadic or denotified people okay how how uh, the notion of homogeneity the notion of uniformity uh, the notion of a monolithic identity is continuously you know challenged and contested and how their life experiences you know uh, evoke the response of a very complicated uh, intersectional you know experience of uh, of marginality uh, how they live with different strands of marginality how they cope with different parameters of marginality and and thereby uh, how they emerge how these autobiographies emerge as a very complex cultural uh, texts uh, almost cultural cartographic texts uh, okay pointing out the uh, the complicated nature of marginality uh, which is experienced by uh, these people who are even in you know marginalized within the marginalized communities this is marginalization within marginalization so in this way how these severely marginalized people uh, you know survive and how they uh, question different forms of you know social order and and how they observe and witness different forms of uh, uh, you know torture and brutality and violence and how they emerge uh, with their inbuilt resilience uh, you know to hold a dialogue with the broader aspects of life so with these few words uh, i uh, i think i should conclude my uh, you know presentation right now and uh, maybe we can uh, accept a few questions if there are any thank you thank you professor acharya <clears throat> for your very thought provoking talk it enhanced our intersectional understanding about marginalized group like dalits in india now we would like to invite questions from audience in this regard we can take only few questions because we are lagging behind the time schedule please hello 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 am i audible uh, yes sir you are audible uh, yes sir yes sir yes sir okay so i have i have already invite questions okay 
Any questions to ask, please, to Professor Acharya? Uh, Preetha, if there is any question, please help Aniruddha, sir. In the if there is any question in the chat box, please help Aniruddha, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Uh, there is one question from uh, Chandrani Boshu. In terms of learning from literature, how can we research marginality in South Asia within sociological studies in an interconnected way with childhoods in different post-colonial societies? Uh, Any more questions? Will you repeat? Hmm. Yes, will you repeat the question? Uh, yes, sir. Hmm. In terms of learning from literature, how can we research marginality in South Asia within sociological studies in an interconnected way with childhoods in different post-colonial societies? Uh, now, this is a, a really a very good question, but I fear that this question uh, would definitely uh, require a very long answer, you know, because uh, this can be the topic of one uh, lecture itself. Uh, uh, but uh, broadly, I can uh, tell you that uh, especially uh, with regard to the marginalized traditions of literature, uh, global marginalized traditions of literature, we can say that in the Indian context, uh, we talk about Dalit and Adivasi uh, literary texts and experiences. Uh, but uh, beyond India, uh, we can also think of, you know, other, you know, neighboring uh, South Asian countries, say, for example, in Bangladesh, in Pakistan, you know, in Nepal, okay, in Sri Lanka, Okay, in and in some other countries, you know, we uh, we definitely experience different narratives of marginality, and in a way, uh, they can be uh, put together in a comparatist framework because uh, because of the differences in their uh, national uh, engagements with different uh, parameters, because of their religious, ethnic, uh, caste, class, and gender identities. And also uh, because of many unique, you know, cultural cartographic situations which prevail in, you know, country is a Buddhist country like Sri Lanka or in an Islamic country like Pakistan or even in a Hindu country like Nepal. Okay, so uh, I think that the the structure of uh, uh, you know marginalized experience uh, will vary from one country to another and if we take it in uh, the context of the entire south asian you know region okay i think it will be a, a vast picture of heterogeneity of diversity of plurality okay, which would definitely demand you know greater research attention in different uh, national contexts so it's definitely uh, can be you know a part of a mega project you know thank you for asking this question any more question uh, uh, sir may i ask a sir, question another, there is no one another <laughs> question uh, have you come across autobiographies by denotified criminal tribes of bengal this is a question from angona dotto uh, yes, this is a, a very interesting question. Thank you, Ongona. Yes, uh, actually, uh, there is one. As of now, uh, I know there is one autobiography by uh, the erstwhile criminal tribe, one of the erstwhile criminal tribes of Bengal. There are, in fact, three erstwhile criminal tribes in Bengal. One is Lodha Shabar, another one is Khadiya Shabar, and the third one is Dikaro. Dikaro are found in Birbhum, okay, Rajnagar area. So uh, there is one I, I know, it's written in Bengali by Prolad Kumar Bhokta, okay, who happened to be the uncle of Chuni Kotal. Chuni Kotal was the first uh, you know, postgraduate student uh, at Vidya Sagar University, Chuni Kotal, anthropology department, yes. And Chuni Kotal was the first graduate from the Lodha tribe. You know, and this Prullad Babu, Prullad Kumar Bhakta, was the maternal uncle of Chuniko. Okay, he wrote his autobiography, okay, and that was uh, Amar Bhubane Ami Beche Thaki. Amar Bhubane Ami Beche Thaki by Prullad Kumar Bhakta. Uh, it has been taken up for translation by the Anthropological Survey of India. I know that. Uh, 
uh, I think uh, Dr. Ajit Dondo, Professor Ajit Dondo has taken up this text for English translation. Okay, I don't know about any uh, other you know, autobiography by any DNT community. Thank you. Uh, sir, there is uh, no other question in the chat box. Uh, if the participants have any further observation or question, uh, they can send it in the chat box and uh, we can address them later otherwise. So if there is uh, no more question, uh, can we move to the next speaker with enormous yes. thanks to both our and uh, to Professor Acharya. Peter, may I ask one question if we have the time? Yes, oh, nice. of course. Shall, uh, shall I? Professor uh, Chaudhary? Yeah. Okay, okay, proceed. Uh, Professor Acharya, this is Shayanton from Sociology. Uh, first of all, thank you for such an enlightening uh, speech. Uh, I just have two questions, I will make it brief. One is uh, your talking about different identities within the tribes. I'm very interested in that uh, because uh, how, because I want to know that how this tribe, since you wrote on social change and literature, how these communities basically resist, resisted the nation state or build a so, sort of a different uh, authority or structure uh, pa parallel to the nation state, if I can use the word, because uh, the nation state has a tendency to homogenize people, categorize people and uh, sort of give a one culture. What is your, your take on that? One. And second is, uh, in connected with social change, can you just mention one or two examples, uh, say, of literature or mu music, which is linked with, say, social movements in, within the scribes? That would be interesting to know. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in fact, uh, once again, I fear that. Uh, the scope of your question is uh, very broad and uh, it's uh, really uh, challenging to answer uh, in a way satisfactorily to these uh, questions, to these uh, two questions uh, within a brief span of time. Uh, but so far as the resistance of uh, the different tribal you know, groups to the, to the homogenizing tendencies of the nation state uh, are concerned, I can say that uh, they resist it with their uh, own, you know, internal, you know, administrative system, and with their own internal, uh, what we should say, and kind of autonomous, okay, council or system of governance. For example, if you look at the the Santali, you know, uh, auto, uh, way of, you know, controlling and administering their own community you would find that they have a very elaborate kind of structure, structure of administration, okay, which, uh, which is uh, uh, very much hierarchical and at the same time, which is uh, very much inclusive in the sense that uh, it is accepted by the members of the community. So uh, even if the, the mainstream notion of you know, controlling and containing the tribal voices uh, had continued uh, since time immemorial. Okay, that uh, the tribal groups have also, in a way, developed you know a fully defined you know internal structure, you know, community and structure of governance, okay, which is accepted by the community people, and which I think uh, uh, is quite sacrosanct in the sense that the Maji, Pargana and other system of governance okay, is generally not meddled with by the, by the mainstream uh, administrative uh, systems. You know, that is not meddled with, particularly in the 21st century context, I can say, uh, thinking of the backlash from different tribal communities, uh, you know, government or the, or the functionaries of the nation state have not uh, taken that risk of interfering with these indigenous systems of governance. Uh, that is one point, and there are, you know, different examples of literary and musical traditions. I have already mentioned the notion of Budhan theater. Budhan theater is the theater of protests. 
which was created okay uh, as a protest for the custodial death of budhan shabar okay a member of the erstwhile criminal tribe khadiya shabar okay budhan was tortured and killed inside police custody okay, in purulia district and you know that how the backlash was felt even in kolkata and several other okay, cities and how mahashweta devi led the movement and how it reached uh, chara nagar of gujarat and how you know dakshin chara a member of the chara community took up the idea of budhan tragedy and developed the theatrical group budhan theater group and they have an now performed in india and abroad in fact they have also developed a movie there okay and it has been screened in hollywood okay a movie based on the life of budhan okay so uh, so we know there are many such traditions uh, where protest traditions traditions of protest okay which have challenged the authoritarian regime of the nation state or the mainstream okay thank you thank you sir okay our uh, thank you professor acharya for your very thought provoking talk now our next speaker hello hello am i audible hello hello yes sir yes sir you are audible uh, our next yes. speaker is professor dr piyali shur head of the department department of sociology jadavpur university we are eagerly waiting to hear from priyali uh, before she starts i would like to request uh, uh, priyali mitro faculty member department of sociology hiralal majumdar memorial college to give a brief introduction of professor shu over to priyali mitro good evening everyone thank you anurudh sir it is indeed our privilege to have you in this session and thank you mr t progress to sir for sharing your thoughts with us now i would like to take this opportunity to introduce our honorable speaker professor priyali shur professor shur presently in the is the department uh, is the head in the department of sociology jadavpur university her research interest and areas of specialization sociology of gender sociology of childhood and sociology of crime and gender she has publications in the areas of gender and childhood nationally and internationally she is currently working in the area of adolescent sexuality and childhood consumption she is the coordinator of the research committee sociology of childhood and youth in indian sociological society She is also a member of the Indian Campaign Committee, Jadavpur University, and joint coordinator, Center of Religion and Society, Department of Sociology, Jadavpur University. Thank you, ma'am, for being here with us. We are eagerly waiting to hear from you. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Priyali Mitra, for the introduction. I hope I am audible. Am I clearly audible? Okay. Yes. Yes. Anuruddha, da, shona jachche. Ha, shona jachche clearly. Acha. I would like to congratulate the organizers of this uh, three-day national ICCSR uh, sponsored e-conference. I would like to thank the principal of Hiralal Mojumdar College for Women, Dr. Shoma Ghosh, for organizing this e-conference. Yesterday was uh, really a very uh, enriching experience for me uh would like to thank dr pritha kundu and shantan ghosh joint conveners of this conference a special thanks to dr chandraboli dotto for inviting me to speak on a very uh, interesting theme childhood and intersectionality in the indian context and a very warm greetings to dr anirudh choudhury i have known uh, anirudh da for years for i don't know for how many years for 15 years 20 years i don't know i cannot uh, calculate so uh, good evening anirudh da and good evening to all the participants so today i'll be speaking on uh, consumption 
childhood and parenting practices and uh, intersectional analysis and i'll be uh, using the lens of class to understand the consumption practices of children so before the theoretical uh, departure point is that consumption is a means of social reproduction social inequalities are actually reproduced experienced and resisted through consumption and consumption also is central to identity formation through the through cultivation of certain lifestyles and uh, through consumption there is also the engagement with material culture pierre bourdieu the french sociologist had viewed consumption as a process of reproducing dispositions that constitute differential takes and rise from the pursuit of a conduct of life within certain objective given circumstances this objective circumstances are related to uh, a person's uh, material wealth which he called economic capital uh, types of knowledge which he called cultural capital and access to network which he called social capital all this uh, economic capital social capital cultural capital all these act as resources that are deployed in the process of uh, consumption consequently class shapes consumption orientation and consumption is representative of acts to reproduce class based social relations david buckingham a noted scholar on childhood consumption used consumption in a very broad sense it is he said that consumption is not about only purchasing goods but how the ways in which the goods can be used both individually and collectively and it is not only about goods it is also about services markets play a crucial role here for example advertisers for example advertisers pushing uh, parents mothers to buy uh, products promising to ensure the child's maximum development such products are marketed through promises of fun with a purpose if you go to a mall you will see that mothers are looking for uh, board games that will not only uh, that will ensure the child's cognitive development as well as it will be a play thing also so consumption it is not only it has it is not only about commodities it is not only about goods about clothes about food but also about services about uh, advertising it is also has to do about education about media about leisure so and it is not only about objects and commodities but also about pleasures about what meanings that these commodities have for children as as well as for their parents so uh, my presentation will focus on how children depending on their social class are positioned in relation to education and leisure uh, to start off i would be actually using annette laurier's uh, much cited work unequal childhoods where she reflects on social class and race in american life she said middle class families engage in a process of concerted cultivation by which she meant that middle class families want to cultivate the talents of children not only through enrolling them in so called good private schools but also enrolling them in enrichment activities and actually to uh, actually to middle class parents children are projects they are projects that need to be invested on developed and uh, these con the uh, and this requires a lot of time spent on doing homework together trips to cultural venues and even the focus is on making 
and finding the child through developing their how to develop the talents which are there and how to develop the child talents of the child through putting enrolling them into schools good schools and enrichment activities however in working class and poor households by contrast the cultural logic of parenting is accomplishment of natural growth these parents strive sometimes in very very difficult circumstances to ensure that their children are safe they are fed they are loved and that they grow and thrive into adulthood so building on this uh, lorio's work i had actually done a, a study uh, which was a uh, rusa 2.0 sponsored i had uh, done a study on consumptive practices of children and i had interviewed families uh, belonging to uh, 10 families belonging to uh, the lower class uh, economically disadvantaged 10 from middle class and 10 families from upper class the age of the children were from 10 to 12 years and the income of the families of the lower class were not less than 10000 so why did i uh, interview families why didn't i only interview children because children's consumption should not be seen in individualistic terms it is embedded in a network of social relationships where parents are the key actors in this network performing the role of providers regulators gatekeepers because when we when children consume it is actually the parents who are buying the parents who are also consuming with them so i have interviewed families uh this is the reason i'm giving for interviewing families relationship between parents and children in consumption is actually i saw characterized by ambivalence constituting a lot of negotiations which i'll be speaking on uh and social class is of course a issue here so coming now let me uh go to my findings and uh, coming to education actually prime importance is given to education irrespective of class schools offering a total curriculum with a focus on high levels of educational attainment access to sports as well as where you have opportunities to achieve in drama arts music were sought after Uh, by uh, upper and middle classes uh, and it requires actually to uh, locate the schools it requires a lot of uh, resources cultural social as well as economic uh, families appear to make the decision about which schools to send their children based on recommendations from friends a history of previous generations attending the school having looked around the school and being impressed with the school's friendliness and uh, or uh, just liking the feel of the place in some uh, in some cases the required entrance exams had li limited the ability to make a choice so uh, while looking at the priorities of the parents uh, i found that uh, in which school to enroll their children to i found that marker one the reputation of the school it mattered a lot in terms of heritage in terms of history and cultural elitism uh, strong academic uh, reputation marker two was the breadth of opportunities that the school provided and marker three was whether the school is providing individual attention or not to develop the hidden potential of the child so for most upper class um, parents schools in the city that had earned a name nationally as well as globally and had a plethora of extracurricular activities were preferred uh, 
because they wanted academic development as well as a, a holistic development of their children to the lower class uh, parents now child is also an asset that needs to be nurtured well so that he or she can compete with the rest of the world and can get them out of the poverty and give them and so their only priority was putting them into uh, or enrolling them to english medium private schools so the for the lower class education of the children was perceived as the only medium through which you can escape class disadvantages so during this pandemic uh, the education of the children of the lower class is suffering the most uh, as uh, yesterday professor gulab bhadro had stated in a presentation that yes many uh, that uh, that she had given an example that a uh, teenager in kerala had committed a had committed suicide because she did not have uh, the device for online education so because all the schools have moved to online education you need to have a mobile but what the lower class uh, they have the, uh, they have only one mobile and maybe that belongs to the father who is now going out to work so what i have uh, after the lockdown i i again started my interviews and i saw that they are resorting to sharing and this sharing is a very important aspect of consumption of lower class children this will be discussed in detail much later uh, but you are you share they are sharing their uh, mobile phones so that they can be exposed or they can get to the online get to online education and the parents also want that their education should not stop because um, as a maid told me didi i do not want my uh, children or my girl to work as a maid in another person's house so i want her to have a good future to earn so this is the thing they want their children to be educated to escape the class disadvantages but this was not so a decade back where lower the children of the lower class families were contributing their labor to the family economy and there was a pitched battle between what portion of the earnings uh, one will keep the child will keep to himself or herself and uh, for watching movies for other consumer delights and how much uh, uh, she or he will give to the family economy and consumption was uh, more or less on the slide by contrast now these children are experienced sick childhood as a period of dependency so i have said that my lower class uh, families that i have interviewed they had a minimum income of 10 to 12000 so the only go to the parents was that uh, to expect out of schooling that their children would grow up in a different crowd than their immediate disorganized neighborhoods ensuring a better future for the former so this is the the education part now i will move to the leisure activities now i have divided leisure into two one is structured leisure and one is unstructured leisure structured leisure according to leisure theorists is defined as an organized activity that first it is adult led that is it is supervised and or and takes place on a regular basis and has an organization or institutional affiliation structured activities do not include time spent alone or activities in which children merely ha hang out with friends relatives playing games here in a uh, structured leisure activities means activities where you are enrolled for fees 
so in this study in my study i found that there are two types of structured leisure activities one was sports and another was uh cultural and i found greater participation in structured leisure activities among upper and middle class children than working class children so this genre of children's leisure activities plays an important role in maintaining and furthering social inequalities since children from all social classes do not enjoy similar levels of access to these paid for lessons since uh, as said since middle class parents see their children as projects to be developed and uh, there is a concerted cultivation so they are enrolled in a lot of activities and this enrollment in activities i have also found has to do with the uh, the perception that <coughs> if you leave the child uh, to themselves they will engage in unproductive leisure activities they will uh, watch uh, um, movies mobile phones or televisions another thing was that they were enrolled in, in this uh, enrichment activities because parents do not want middle and upper class parents do not want them to play unsupervised outside in their neighborhoods there we are living in a risk to society and there is always the perception of risk for girls it is uh, sexual abuse primarily and for boys uh, it has to uh, uh, for boys it has to do with uh, uh influence of uh, bad boys drugs maybe the boys will get engaged in physical fights so children uh, so parents do not want them mark to play outside and they enroll them in this enrichment activities which will also cultivate their talents uh but the thing is the word of uh, here i want to say it was observed that middle class parents put them in uh, this enrichment activities as long as that their studies do not suffer middle class parents are be shown bhabe they are very much into that they want their children to do very well in studies get the highest grades and i mean both money study obsessed so uh, only if uh, these uh, enrichment activities are not Uh, obstruction to their doing well in our academ academics they are this uh, run smoothly the wealthy members of so, uh, the social class take their children to learn and play there and uh, you know, it is uh, and when i come to when i was uh, uh, interviewing lower class parents and children i found that lower class children also express their interest to learn to learn like playing a uh, football to learn karate cricket but these things are continuously postponed by their parents due to lack of money and they also feel that these activities are unproductive lower class parents prefer to use the money for tuitions rather than any enrichment activity however children take the lead in deciding whether and which activity to participate for many parents their children's interest in an activity is the primary reason for supporting it many children select an activity as friends are enrolled there peers become an important source of influence as well as social media uh, it has been observed that parents do have a very strong influence on what activities that their children will join for example one of the uh, one of my uh, participants a girl she said that she would like to enroll in a bollywood dance but her mother felt that she should enroll in traditional indian dance as she wanted her daughter to be exposed to rich 
cultural traditions of India. So here Madhur's art was seen to having the greatest influence in both the information gathering and final decision stages of the decision making process, which uh, Hayes has said intensive mothering. It involves a heavy investment of mother's time, energy, emotional commitment to enhance child's physical, social and emotional development. This is not to express that children do not have agency, that their mothers are only pushing them, enrolling them in certain activities. Children are agential. They drop out from activities that do not consume their interest. For example, one of my participants, every Wednesday he had a stomach ache before going to the piano lesson. And he wouldn't go, his mother couldn't take him to the lesson and in the end he dropped out. To not to go to that uh, enrichment activity. So middle class children, I found they were enrolled maximum in three activities. And uh, it was observed that boys participated more heavily in sports while both boys uh, and girls participated in cultural activities. Now coming to the unstructured leisure part. Unstructured leisure part has two components. One is family leisure, where you, uh, where family leisure, uh, referring to the activities that different family members participate in together, revealing the importance of children within families, with parents and they are spending time together. Family leisure outings are the outcomes of negotiations between children and parents, they are uh, class, in, also they are very much class informed. They place, uh, take place mostly in the weekends where uh, the child maybe is taken to the nearest city malls. All these have stopped during the lockdown and the pandemic. Imagine the situation of the child, of the children who were used to visiting the malls, playing in the game zones, uh, minimum for an hour and this uh, shopping malls or these privatized public spaces have become the shopping destination of the affluent class, promising class experience of consumption. So it is children who decide how long they are going to spend in the game zones. Eating out is also a very favorite consumption activity of the upper and middle class children. Children are taught to con how to consume as parents put forward choices and cultivate taste from which children choose. They also watch movies that are approved by parents. Children love to, uh, but uh, where to watch the movie is actually depend uh, depends on the parent, whether to take her the, uh, the child to the multiplex, whether to take her to Don Don, or whether to take the ch child to an ordinary movie hall. Where shopping is concerned, I found that there is regulated consumption to some variation, where children are made aware of what they can buy and what they cannot. For example, one of my participants took her daughter to shops where she knew the prices were a little less because she knew her daughter will buy a lot of things. And she took her daughter to game zones on Wednesdays when, when there is a discount. So these are also the strategies that parents use. They are strategies that children also use. For example, children say they when they are choosing clothes for consumption, please choose mother from their mother chooses. So the child says everything is actually my choice. So again here I want to come into the lower class children. Here also to hide visible signs of poverty, sharing of clothes. 
shoes and items between siblings and peers sharing as said is a very very important aspect of lower class children so parents here not only act as gatekeepers regarding what can be consumed but families that consume outside of home not only show what they can afford to do so but they also show where not to go in their consumption of specific spaces families express their belonging to those spaces and related persons this also reflects exclusionary elements spaces and people with whom one does not wish to be associated for instance i gave the example whether i'll watch a movie at a multiplex nondon or a cinema hall is the decision that i will take and here also i want to say that uh, it is not only the parents not only play a significant role but for the child the kings and their peer group also plays a very significant role children's desire for consumer goods is the need to fit in within the peer group and uh, in this family lecture i have found that the lower class families they go to outings mainly to the public parks where there is no fee and playgrounds where there is free entry and strolling inside the malls and visiting uncles and aunts inside the malls they feel they are not regarded as worthy of attention and these spaces are often experienced as alien and hostile now coming to the last point is casual leisure within unstructured leisure we have family leisure and then comes casual leisure children's uh, another uh, children's interaction with media technologies playing with friends toys and various non consumptive activities such as reading storytelling or uh, and other imaginative avenues of solitary leisure can be seen through the prism of casual leisure for the lower class children the common play areas when you, when they are in casual leisure the common play spaces are, are the free uh, free uh, the parks having swings slides open fields uh, nearby uh, nearby roads and lanes boys have lesser restrictions in playing outside neighborhoods than girls though in disorganized neighborhoods lower class parents also perceive this so uh, it was observed that boys were either bought bicycles or were allowed to borrow but girls were not allowed to wander far for middle class children the lives are really supervised because there has been a decrease in outside outside play and heavy restriction because of the perception of risk i spoke about so uh, regarding indoor activities parents encourage reading fiction and non fiction but in the study children hardly they are interested in reading books parents decision to buy commodities for indoor leisure activities depend on whether children are making use of them and when and it does not hamper development for instance a mother said that he she buys craft items for a child as a child is genuinely interested and put them to use within indoor in in uh, indoor activities gaming is a frequently uh, frequent activity where boys are across the class are more interested in car racing pubg and violent games girls are more interested unfortunately i found in youtube showing makeup and fashion what to watch is dependent on peer suggestions children in lower class families who have only may have only one mobile phone and they may borrow from kings staying nearby lower class children also watch children with also watch uh, television with parents than spend time online 
as they neither have computers or small smartphones and middle class children are really getting i'm ending this because i've taken a lot of time middle class children are really getting hooked to internet and during this pandemic they are getting more hooked to the internet there are three forms of parental mediation i saw restrictive mediation which uh, establishes rules what uh, amount of time you can watch and what content you can watch there is active mediation also from the parents where parents discuss with children what are the content you can watch and there is also co viewing the third form of uh, mediation is co viewing uh, where children uh, where parents along with children watch media and child children are not allowed to give personal information by anything online fill out online uh, forms use email or play games on the internet however they were not allowed to chat with friends but now due to the pandemic chatting with friends is the only resource that uh, that children have to avoid to be together despite physical distancing thank you i am ending this thank you to the chair for giving so much of time to uh, present my study thank you to all the participants Anirudha, please unmute yourself. Sorry, Pali. Sorry, Pali. Sorry, sorry. Ah, uh, thank you very much. Ah, uh, it's very thought-provoking talk, Pali. Particularly on this contemporary issue we are facing today. regarding consumption childhood and parenting practices uh we are lagging behind the schedule so i would like to request you to stay with us after completion of mr deep purokasto stock we will take questions from the audience for both the speakers in our interactive session now i would uh, uh our next speaker is uh, mr deep dashgupto uh executive director project a renowned non profit organization before mr prakash to uh, starts sharing with us his field based experience i will uh, request chandra boli chandra boli dotto uh, please give a brief discussion uh, about mr dashgupto before he uh, starts वर्किंग विद बॉयज एंड यंग मैन on gender equity and masculinities since 1997 through project of which he is the founder director his work has been primarily focused on children especially boys in different circumstances including itinerant children in contact with the railways and children in institutions he currently works with young people in 12 districts to set up youth collectives that campaign for gender equity and intervene during situations of gender discrimination and violence including child marriage child trafficking etc he has been advocating for the restructuring of the custodial approach to the rights of children adolescents and other young people 
and has been highlighting how recognizing the agency of children and their choice and consent can eliminate institutionalized stigma, discrimination, and violence against them. So, with this brief introduction uh, to our next speaker, uh, I hand the session over to our honorable chairperson once again. Sir, please uh, invite Mr. Speaker. Mr. Uh, Deep Purokasto, please. Um, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Professor Choudhury, and uh, uh, also thank you to Hiralal College for having me here. Uh, my uh, job has been made a little easier because my previous speakers, um, uh, Dr. Acharya and Dr. Shur, have already mentioned some very important points around which uh, I will be talking about my work with uh, uh, itinerant young children belonging to nomadic tribes again. Uh, I work with uh, many nomadic tribes here in Bengal and uh, among one of them is a tribe called the Bed community. And uh, this particular group of the Bed community is basically somebody who had a traditional uh, uh, livelihood of actually uh, collecting honey. And uh, over the last decade, their, their livelihoods have been uh, really affected and uh, because they would actually be employed by a lot of villagers and especially uh, city dwellers uh, in, in whose homes there would be trees and there would be um, beehives in those trees. So a lot of city dwellers and other residents would consider that to be uh, a little risky. So they would actually ask uh, uh, members of this uh, nomadic community to come and uh, get the beehive off. And as part of their uh, they would get a little bit of money and the honey would be theirs. So that was one of the ways in which uh, their livelihood would uh, take place. Uh, and over time, uh, what happened was with uh, decreasing biodiversity, huge ecological changes, uh, this community realized that there were less and less and less of bees. And so there were lesser beehives and there was no honey that they could actually uh, harvest from uh, urban areas or, or areas which had uh, maybe rural and semi-rural areas which had uh, a population, a dense population. And um, as a result, what they did was that without any other uh, uh, niche or space that they had to get into the economy, uh, they started digging in and around railway stations. And um, let me say that while we, we've all been talking, I think from last yesterday also uh, about uh, intersectionality. And of course, one of those intersectionalities was poverty and uh, that about uh, how people are poor and how that uh, actually affects uh, children differently. We've just had a presentation on how uh, access to resources, thereby leading to different patterns of consumption actually makes differences even in children's lives. But however, what uh, is needs to be highlighted that internationally, poverty can also be a ground of discrimination. And poverty can be a ground in which uh, children can be distinguished negatively from other children. And uh, this is very stark, especially in railway stations, where uh, uh, the word used for a lot of children, including those of the itinerant communities uh, who uh, beg for a living, is called Kangali and Kangali is this uh, terribly disparaging term used by everybody else in this the station surroundings and now also adopted by the children themselves uh, to define themselves as an identity. So here somehow becoming poor is not just a condition, uh, somehow uh, through this identity of a Kangali, uh, becoming poor becomes an, I mean, being poor becomes an identity. Uh, which makes it very dangerous because uh, uh, being uh, if I'm poor and I might aspire to get out of poverty in some way or the other, I might ask for help from the state and others, other actors to help me get out of poverty because I don't think that poverty is, a, is, is this constant state to be in. But Kangali as an identity uh, gives you almost uh, like it damns you to you know, stick uh, to that identity that you will never get out of this and this is how your life will be. So all those other uh, aspects of life and lifestyle, which comes from this poverty of being a Kangali, seems to get adapted as part of one's own culture. Uh, and then everything that uh, you are stigmatized with 
is almost protected as you know as 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 a as a as a um, as an indicator of uh, you know one's own culture so um, so i will be speaking on this ground where uh, a lot of itinerant children actually uh, face um this sort of discrimination for being poor and that we need to really uh, keep in uh, keep in mind uh, i will be discussing two types of structural intersectionalities and when i use this word intersectionality i use it in the common uh, the common understanding of uh, different identities which lead to either uh, discrimination or privilege or a lack of privilege and uh, given the fact that are the entire child protection system and the legislation and the policies the laws around it and the practices around it um are governed by as you people will know that is the juvenile justice act and various other acts also but primarily the juvenile justice act so the structural intersectionality uh, that is created here out of the laws and the policies and the practices of the institutions the states and the authorities um actually makes it uh, very difficult for a lot of children to even be visible uh, for example their itinerant status their status always to be on the move and on the roads so the juvenile justice act actually defines any child who is found begging on the streets without an ostensible source of income without a particular household or a home or a structure that they called home to be a child in need of care and protection and immediately uh, that child needs to be produced before a child welfare committee and uh, if either sent back home if the home is located or uh, stay back in an institution uh, for itinerant uh, communities uh, this is one big major threat that itinerant communities have parents are threatened by this entire system children are threatened by the entire system because yes they are begging yes there is no ostensible source of income and yes there is no house or a household at the moment that they can call their own because they are living on very makeshift camps in uh, in in a, in a field near the railway station they are living in a, a makeshift camp outside the limits of the village uh, so there there is no uh, ostensible uh, source of living or uh, or house so uh, obviously uh, the act then takes uh, goes a step forward and then uh, declares the parents to be unfit and incapable of providing uh, a childhood please keep in mind that you know the definition that we have of childhood is also a definition of um, that which is very middle class and upper class definition of what a childhood is of what childhood is the child must have a particular home okay Carry on. Uh, okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, very much audible. Okay. So a child. Um, so I was talking about a child does not who does not have a home, uh, and uh, so the child will be incarcerated. So this is a structural uh, intersectionality which I want to point out to you is that there are a lot of children from itinerant communities. will actually be incarcerated will actually be discriminated against by a structure which actually says that the rights of the child need to be uh, protected uh, mm, there is also another uh, thing called Uh, that uh, for practitioners like uh, us uh, we realize that one of the reasons that a lot of the itinerant tribes do not uh, lack a lot of political heft is because of their uh, small numbers actually as communities if you take 
uh, the the itinerant and denotified tribes and nomadic and semi-nomadic tribes in their entire entirety. Uh, that's a huge number, but tribes do not perceive themselves as part of this huge collective. They perceive themselves as very small in numbers, even in that particular tribe for the Beit tribe I'm talking about as an example of uh, tribes in general. They're also dispersed. So you have a Beit tribe which will have a sort of a, uh, uh, an Adda or an Astana in uh, say Horichandrapur in Malda. And they would have another one in Kamakha Guri and another one in Poshchim Mandoman in near Ondal. So they are all uh, like very spread out and they're very dispersed and there are very, very few occasions where they actually uh, come together. And the other thing is that uh, we've already heard about uh, the fact that a lot of politicians and other people uh, do not really give them more, uh, importance because in the electoral and political system, um, their numbers don't seem to really matter, though many have uh, voter cards, but their numbers don't seem to matter because they're not politically organized. And it is not, again, let me say, a case of pure upper caste discrimination only against uh, itinerant communities. It is a general discrimination of non-nomadic uh, communities against uh, itinerant communities. It is not really that only a few or a particular castes would be discriminating against them. Uh, 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 Professor uh, Acharjo mentioned their difficulty during the lockdown and uh, many of these communities, even when they had cash, were uh, disallowed by people in villages to actually line up in front of uh, a common mudir dokan to buy uh, dal and other spices. And they were told that, you know, you are going to be the last, that, that the whole village is going to buy and you're going to be the last and we don't care if you have money or not. So again, as you say here, that even if an itinerant community uh, has money to purchase, again here, this, this entire logic of the market, that the market is only running after money and not after other things, is sometimes, you know, uh, it collapses here in, at a small village scale uh, level. But uh, what I was trying to actually mention is that uh, this, uh, the fact that uh, when uh, itinerant communities have to come together on a common platform, you know, one of these uh, big, uh, uh, you know, uh, conflicts we have is about how much of uh, homogeneity that we do we need to create? Because somewhere when we try to get people together and have them gel in a team, there needs to be some sort of, uh, you know, uh, highlighting of where the similarities are. Sometimes um, a celebration of where the similarities are and where we will perhaps need to keep some of the diversity on hold. So at the same time, uh, it is a diversity of these smaller communities which actually uh, give them their strength and their resilience. So that is a, a, a sort of a trade-off that we are always uh, looking at, uh, whether this is the right thing or the, uh, the wrong thing. And the second thing is about the voice when it comes to political intersectionality. We heard about a lot of these autobiographies uh, being written by uh, people from uh, denotified tribes. They're talking about their boyhoods. Uh, let me tell you from my experience that, you know, we need to continuously question whether that is also, that is a voice, but that is the voice, that is the voice for communities. Going to school uh, influences the worldview and the way the child looks at his or her community or himself or others of the community very differently from a child who has not gone to school. And we do not have too many non-school going voices. Uh, whether you write in your mother tongue or not, the very faculty of being able to write, to be able to think in a particular way, to put your experiences together, uh, actually makes you a little different from the other voices of the community. So possibly uh, some of the voices, uh, when they are published, will seem to us um, talking about uh, somewhere, uh, talking about, uh, you know, a lot of conflicts because in the story that came in and which I would like to uh, emphasize is, you know, the contradiction here also that is in the minds of young children. Uh, on one hand, this uh, a boy who had saved up this money for studies and his books. Um, and then there is the other point where uh, uh, he says when the grandfather steals the money that, you know, it's grandfathers who are supposed to uh, provide money to grandchildren, not the other way. How? What a, what a shame that you have stolen my money. Here, this child actually has two different aspects all at the same time. 
on one aspect he is adult life he is earning he is saving money he is planning he is very rationally looking at how money and access to the resource that he has can help him in education on the other hand he is also infantilizing himself and saying that you know how dare a grandfather uh, steal money from a grandchild actually it's the duty of the grandfather to give to a grandchild i would like all of you to actually you know especially because this is a discussion on intersectionality to actually look at this also you know these contradictions within oneself of the child when he wants to be an adult on one hand and then he wants to be uh, a child on when this happens what are the power dynamics within which uh, the same child will be actually talking in uh, multiple voices and um, what i would also like to talk about in this case is that uh, while we are also talking about the structural and political uh, intersectionality and these are all external uh, discrimination issues a lot of children who come from itinerant communities the the way we uh, build them is largely that they are always embedded within their communities but let me say this that also dr acharya mentioned that that even within other uh, communities there is a lot of discrimination i will talk, talk to you about how this discrimination and not and uh, dr shur has also men mentioned different types of capital i would like to add time capital as a concept to this so uh, you know when some of my colleagues went first to the bait community they would see a lot of bait men uh, you know lazing around they would be drinking and not doing work and the women there would be actually doing work they would be the ones who would come to talk to us they would be what seemed like decision makers in the community very soon um, i think uh, we started looking at it in a different way because this entire society was patrilineal it was patriarchal uh, somehow the fact uh, this was not sitting well i mean if we are sort of assuming that the women in this communities are actually uh, running uh, the uh, the economy of the tribe and at the same time uh, you know there is violence against them too and against children how do you explain what is happening i mean here is part being part of economic activities is that at all an indicator of power so here comes in time capital time capital is the amount of time that you can afford to spending uh, in the economically productive sense so where you're not producing anything as such so you might just be staring at the sky or you might be doing something else but you have time capital and you are time rich that way so the men in the communities were actually very time rich they were drinking they were lazing around they were not really working it was the women who were uh, working and earning the money and the men had full control over that so this was again transferred to the children of the community children had no time capital so when we set up our uh, drop in centers uh, uh, the children would not actually come to the drop in center they would they would be very friendly with us but they will say no no we will have to beg we will have to earn this amount of money and bring it back to our mothers uh, and etc and we have to go back give this to our family we cannot spend time here you know uh, studying and etc we want to study we want to play but we don't we don't have the time and there have been many times when a child might have just sort of sneaked in into the uh, drop in center and then the parent would come in and you know would make some sort of excuse and take the child away so the children absolutely had no time capital um, uh, there was some time capital that the women had but again the women were also doing something productive in their sense that you know they would actually be looking after and supervising the children who were begging from a small distance if you still go to uh, other different railway stations for example new jalpaiguri you will find children begging and a little distance you will find women sitting in a in a group uh, trying to supervise them and just keeping uh, uh, an eye on what is happening and uh, maybe you can also look up some of the etymological uh, you know sources of the word beta and beti or beta and beti uh, that we have in a some lot of north indian languages and you will find that you know that it is actually related to a sanskrit word for begar uh, you know um, free labor and uh, it makes it very clear to us how um, this also becomes a sort of internal discrimination uh, when we are really looking at that and how i'm coming back to this that you know if what we called our own sons and daughters are def are derived from the sanskrit word for free labor uh, you know you know it's very easy to say that um, you know that you know the kangali becomes an identity uh, and that identity uh, is something which if we do not really look at 
uh, we will never be able to define the best interest uh, of a child. And uh, this is uh, really important to look at that, you know, that poverty as an identity has never really been looked at uh, very uh, clearly. And there are children, there are communities where maybe the poverty as an identity comes in as something that we really, really need to look at. So do not want to take up much time, but, uh, you know, uh, so I want to end my uh, thing there for everybody else. Uh, hello. <clears throat> hello. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deep Purokastor. Uh, thank you. Uh, your talk is very spontaneous, basically based on your field experiences and your nice observations, particularly for the marginalized community. Now, uh, because of short of time, uh, we would like to invite questions from the audience. Please put it on your ch chat box. PL, uh, hello, Chandraboli, or uh, anyone who are taking the questions? Hello. Yes. Hello. Sir, uh, here is a question for question for Dr. Pierre Shur. Yes. In the case of unstructured consumption, was there any particular example where the child did not confirm his or her class position, a particular agency, cutting across class expectation other than desire for education as means, I suppose, to social mobility? The larger question is. Is the class position a sort of a priori, a priori, uh, a disposition in matters of consumption or an effect? That is how the question of agency could be conceived vis-a-vis -vis class position. Really? Really? Yes. Uh. <coughs> The question is, yeah, can I be heard? <coughs> Madam, should I repeat? Hmm? No, no, no. I can see the question on the chat. Yes, I can see the question on the chat box. Uh, actually, uh, all children have agency. All children have agency and uh, in matters of consumption, uh, there is... Uh, Always there is negotiation between uh, parents and children. Okay, sometimes uh, uh, parents trying to impose and children, they are uh, resisting. Um, they, are, or they are resisting uh, the parental impositions. So uh, there, uh, there is this relationship of ambivalence which I spoke about. So this is not only it is... Uh, not any class specific it happens uh, throughout uh, the uh, it, uh, it is irrespective of class so uh, the uh, first uh, this is the answer to the latter part of the question and to the first part was there any, uh, any particular example where the uh, in unstructured consumption no it is actually unstructured leisure uh, Yes, there was consumption where uh, actually uh, I'm, uh, I have observed that four or, or five boys from deprived background, they had gone to a very elite mall and they had gone to a food hub. And I said that sharing is a very important aspect of consumption of the deprived uh, class. So they had taken one burger, they could, whatever money they had, they could only buy one burger and all the four boys, they could only have one bite of the burger. So this I found is, a, is an example of a, a child who from a deprived background is going to a privatized mall, he, they are not just trolling, they are going in, consuming, uh, 
consuming according to their desires. Thank you. Any more question? Uh, thank you, madam. Here are uh, two more questions for Mr. Purakastha. One is from Shahili Chowdhury. So the time capital is being transferred to economic capital when it comes to children and not the adult male members. What happens when the same male child becomes a male adult? Do they reverse the capital? Okay, the first answer uh, that I have for this question is that actually there is no transfer as such. Uh, if you have time capital, you automatically have economic capital. The children are seen begging and collecting the money, uh, but the money is actually controlled uh, by the men through the women, the adult women. So if you have, if you possess time capital, you actually also possess uh, economic capital. And that is why I was also highlighting the fact that, uh, you know, children are seen as, uh, you know, free sources of free labor for uh, uh, income. So children sometimes do not have either have, uh, uh, you know, uh, they neither possess time capital, as I said, that they do not have time to come and do things what they want on their, uh, on their own. And they, of course, do not have economic capital. The, the, the women in the community actually sit at a space trying to actually uh, uh, survey uh, which child is being given how much money and so that, you know, they can also keep a count on that. So there is a surveillance system also in, in place. So, uh, so there is no reversal of the capital as such. I mean, the men don't, uh, you know, operate, unfortunately, don't operate like that. Uh, uh, the the older child, the very, uh, the man, male child actually grows up and knows that this is what is going to happen. So he also gets into the, uh, you know, not working in quote unquote, uh, uh, and not uh, earning money so much. Yes. I don't know if I've answered your question and if that's what you'd asked. Any more question? Nitha? Hello. Hello, Pritha. Hello. So the, there is another question. We are facing challenges with children of below poverty line families. How shall we overcome the situation? This is from Gopal Chandra Mondal. It's, it's, it's a little difficult to answer this question, let me say, because if we do not know what those particular challenges are there, as you know, are a lot of challenges with children who come from uh, families below the poverty line. So, you know, answers will answers are not that simple. Uh, there is, uh, you know, the biggest challenge now is the digital divide, for example. And I don't think we have been able to, as far as even as social interventionists, have been able to really uh, respond to it adequately. So... I don't know. I'm unfortunately I will not be able to answer such a uh, you know wide question uh, like this without knowing exactly what that issue is about. Uh, is there any more question? I, I can't see any in the chat box. So in case uh, there is no other question in the chat box or no respondent is uh, voicing it out, we may consider that um, we can call the session to an end. Thanks once again very much to Aniruddha sir and all our distinguished speakers. Uh, now I would like to invite Shantanda from the Department of Sociology to deliver the formal vote of thanks. Pritha, uh, yes, 
uh, on behalf of the college i must say that today's session was so enlightening that uh, saying thank you is not enough to show how much we were enlightened this is my sincere thanks to all the speakers including the chairperson of the day over to shanton thank you ma'am thank you thank you ma'am i think ma'am has already uh, said in a nice way uh, on behalf of our college we would like to thank all the speakers including an our chairperson we would like to thank professor indril in acharya for his enlightening speech particularly in respect to literature it's very interesting here actually it has given us a variety of thought Look, I thank Professor Piali Shur for her field work and very informed knowledge. Particularly, the consumption of children is very crucial, I guess, and it has not been researched thoroughly. So, ma'am has done. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Mr. Deep Purokaisto, thank you, sir, for sharing with us your field experience. It's always a pleasure to listen from all of you. And Professor Anurudh Choudhury. i don't think i can thank you sir if your department your college i can only say that continue to shower your blessings for us in the future hope to get your support in the future and i thank all participants uh i can only thank uh, our honorable principal madam she has always provided her thorough support without her support it wouldn't have been possible to conduct such a seminar she has always encouraged us in these ac academic activities so thank you ma'am i would like to thank dr rupa shen our iqc coordinator dr lipika mollik bar sir mr mr pradeep to mukherjee convener of seminar subcommittee dr pradeep das our honorable tcs i would like to thank the department of english dr pritha kundu sarvajay di sabani di and all of them my colleagues Dr. Chandrabali Datto, Piyali Mitra, Kamalika Das Majumdar, Vendila Datto, and Chipurna Shet. I would like to thank all members of our college, teaching and non-teaching members, and all participants. Without your your support, it wouldn't have been possible. I would like to thank ICSSR for the so their support. Mr. Shoibal Kaur was present yesterday. Thank you for that, and hope. we would have a great day tomorrow as well thank you thank you all uh, hello 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 please uh, follow shantanta uh, there is a mistake on my part i sincerely apologize for that this is uh, the vote of thanks for the uh, invited speaker session we have another session uh, after this there are some paper presenters with us yeah, yeah. and yeah. Uh, they have not yet presented their papers so i should have said uh, vote of thanks for the uh, non technical session that is the invited speaker session we have uh, the technical session left yet so yeah yeah i, I think we should proceed with the right uh, yeah yes, yes. Yeah. thank you now, now i would request on you to sir to uh, call the speakers for the technical session and uh, let them proceed uh, okay thank you vitha uh but uh, i also have uh, a big uh, uh, just apology from you that after uh, 15 minutes i have also to leave no i have some urgent you know some occupation so uh, more 15 minutes i am here uh, so uh, let us start paper presenting session today we have five uh, paper presenter here uh so uh, just uh, we should not waste time uh, i would like to call professor snehobrat mukherjee uh, assistant professor uh, in a government college of west bengal please present your paper I, we should uh, you know we 5 uh, to 8 minutes you should you know submit your paper okay thank you am i audible sir yes you are audible okay sir. Uh, good evening all of you my topic is uh, reliving and rediscovering childhood a sociological struggle 
so this present paper deals with the relational approach of sociology that the child experiences at the early stages of their life as we all know the babies were initially depend on their mother father and the significant other whom they develop an emotional attachment and help to form a relationship in the wider so society it further entails some of the theoretical approaches of sociology to understand the early lives of the childhood lastly it also focuses some of the contemporary issues that are affecting childhood in a country like india uh, childhood is the most beautiful and the happiness part of an individual it is the foundation of an adulthood the success of an individual is basically depends upon the smooth nurturing and nourishment in the childhood at the very core childhood needs extra protection care from the adults as they are totally mentally and physically depend upon them as we all know india is also one such country who tries to go battle in order to ensure protection from the childhood since a long day back assembly on the rights of the child in the form of development protection and meaningful participation in the society while talking about the lives of the children it is necessary to keep in mind the culture the economic conditions that impacts on their quality of life most of the countries build certain plans in the context of wider social welfare issues for the children in our country the children often seem to live with their parents at the one side of the coin while in the other side also observe certain <coughs> children are often live on the street or in certain institution platforms in the circumstance in these circumstances rather child labor child trafficking child abuse crimes against uh, children are common phenomena in the context in this context the survival for the children is the basic concern with the, the proper nutrition level health care safe drinking water elementary education protection from the infectious diseases etc India is signifying the country to the convention on the child rights by providing varied need in terms of food shelter clothing and education the policies and the practices and needs to ensure the basic rights in an indiscriminatory manner in the history of the indian society children always enjoy a special status we observe the numerous occasion that the community celebrate childhood in the form of the birth of a child naming ceremony rice ceremony first day of the formal education and also some informal education in the form of songs dance talk which are regarded the key criteria for child socialization early childhood is always remain a major source of constant focus in 1953 the responsibility of the early childhood education was given to the parents and recommended inclusion of the pre primary indian primary schools now early childhood from a sociological perspective the time childhood the time fine it is of, often associated with the terms terms like early years early childhood there is no certain uh there is a certain vagueness at the span of the child of the children to be recognized as early childhood recognize the children from the birth to the pu puberty within the category of the early childhood our economy is characterized as a mixed economy with having a developing tag unemployment is often trigger the relationship between the child care and mothering in a in a patriarchal society like india early childhood is duty for a mother to do the work for the children one can say that it is highly gendered working sector all paradigm of the caring and the nurturance according to osgood that there is a growing tension among the mothers in the caring the nurturance among the child during the early childhood which requires a high degree of emotional labor and managing the emotions and expectations as a parent the process of early years of childhood is also known as the emotional investment which is an integral part of participating among the parents surrounded by the strong feelings between the children and the families in a wider social context according to moss and dolberg Dahl emotions are the wide should be based on the future professional development of the child and for the same time try try to focus on the long historical roots which can be seen as the social processes the relationship between the young children can be viewed as dynamic continuous and processual these processes is very much a social structure at the one hand and the dynamic on the other which results the transitions that occurred in the dramatic short period in the history of the early childhood among the children while dealing with the sociological approach in the early childhood it needs to develop a multidisciplinary way that should be connected with the other associated disciplines like developmental psychology social policy anthropology education etc the sociologists of early childhood view in terms of the integrate the biological and the social aspect 
together into one unified whole. The early childhood from a sociological orientation needs to focus on the deepest fears and concerns that the child is faced on the cognitive attributes. This one, a famous sociologist explained that the levels of complexity with a metaphor of a clock with the wheels, according to him, the wheels move at a different speed with some cogs are moving slow speed so that the observer gets hardly any time to notice that moment while on the other hand the faster wheels connected so that it makes a balanced wheel and controls the entire machine's movement the slow cog represents the biological time of our history while the faster cog represents the succeeding generation if we look at the past then we notice there is an unbroken chain between the parents and the young children the young children will become parents and their young children needs the older people for their existence and survival to grow up the most influential theory related to the development psychology is that that is based on the realms of the attachment. According to him, a sensitive and a responsive mother is usually needed to the development of child. He views responsive mother as a caretaker. The development is actually based on the emotional security that a mother gives to the child during this stage. Now, childhood from an institutional perspective. Over the last 40 years, India, uh, there is a tremendous increase in the rate of entering in the full-time and the part-time jobs by women. In the contemporary society, where both parents are the dual earners, working full-time, earning and pursuing their own careers, as much more useful comparison has been made between the UK and the Denmark in terms of the maternity leave for the families whose children are under the five years of age. The UK grant 52 weeks, which is unpaid in nature. Due to this, it puts the pressure of the family balance sheet, income and expenditure, while on the Denmark, the parental leave is much more flexible in nature. It ensures that the parent can stay at home when a child at least for one year. Moreover, it also enables the parents to share the childcare work so that even the mothers can continue to pursue their careers. As it has been found in a country like India, younger children who are entered into the system of childcare and education, the transition as observed for the immediate families to a group prayer sitting, uh, settings. This approach led to the individual processes between individual children, caregivers, peer-to-peer -peer, and group interactions as a whole. French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu explores the process of group settings in contrast to the young children's relationship. He addressed the group processes as the habitus, which refer to the white internalized structure and the processes that manifest in the routinized act that are taken for the granted for the young children. He also argued that the children, young children in a particular set of social relationship, the higher the tendency to learn how to behave and act in a particular institutional habitus, whereby the younger children types of thinking, thought processes, and most importantly, the that are acquired for the parents and the new caretakers. Family plays an important role in the process of so socialization. They're not only the receptors, but also the active generators who are actually create their own settings of the social and cultural capital. This particular setting can be useful for understanding the competitive field, which enables to develop an understanding in which where a particular form of capital should be valued and get Hello, important. Yes, it, please, please, please. Okay. How much time you need? Uh, from a Foucault perspective, I will say, uh, power and discourse, yes, we are always tend to think as something as a pol uh, power refers to the something uh, in political, national uh, or anything level. According to Foucault, the entire structure of the society is very much based on the power regime, the child-adult relationship, uh, where the adult holds the top level of the hierarchical structure and gives the instruction to child who follows it. The acceptance of the structure of, from the adults is actually based on the dependence on the nature, nature of the young child. This power of the young ch children, another key important concept that Foucault has discovered is the discourse, which uh, refers to the legitimate nature of the power. The language that we use, the thought we look and understand the world, which are all perceive the world by truth. What Foucault call it as the regimes of truth. This course of the early childhood. The same discourse can be also explained with the relationship between the childhood and sexuality, which is not only the knowledge that the adult may feel uncomfortable and pro or pro problematic, but at the same time, it is based some, through the relations of the young adult children is based on the maintain and reproduce within the structure of the society. And some of the issues that the, the early childhood has been faced in the contemporary in our country, that is the poverty, as we all know, 
it is the main reason that affects the early childhood in uh, any part of the country it faces experiences the initial stages he or she not only deprived of getting the basic amenities but also the uh, unable to develop the capabilities that are helpful for uh, per performing as a member of the so society now the child uh, trafficking is also another important issue that the child has been facing uh, then the exclusion of the education system as we all know there is the proliferation of the forces the lower income group not to enter into that private education and as a result the large number of the children are get now the next is the child in the ju डिस्टेंसिंगलोअर and also reduce for accessing the life saving vaccines lastly it creates a huge psychological impact for the children whose family are experiencing a domestic violence thank you sir thank you snow brato next keka dash are you here keka dash keka dash hello keka absent keka dash now next anushua mitro yes sir anushua. i am here yes sir i am yes. here please in, introduce first yourself anushua yes sir uh, i am anushua mitro state aided college teacher in department of sociology murlidhar girls college today i will be speaking on uh, rethinking uh, rethinking assistive technologies in everyday life of children with walking impairments in kolkata a glimpse of intersection and inequality i would like to present the ppt uh, so just will demand one minute of time from you sir now before going into the ppt i would first want to describe what assistive technologies are assistive technology is an umbrella term that refers to the collection of gadgets uh, communication softwares orthoses and prosthetics and therapeutic interventions that attempt to maintain and promote bodily capabilities of people with impairments these technologies play a decisive role in facilitating participation of impaired population into mainstream activities of society and therefore the united nations corporate uh, convention on rights of Ch children with uh, on rights of people with disabilities have actually designated access to assistive technologies as the fund as the basic human right of people with impairments uh, now Uh, the very commonly used assistive technology for people with walking impairment is that of wheelchair we have all seen a wheelchair it acts as a mobility device for anyone who cannot walk or stand on his own another very commonly used uh, assistive technology for people who are unable to stand or walk on their own is that of ankle foot orthosis which is called afos and it is specifically used for children so it is a medicated shoe kind of a thing which is uh, you know which the child is made to wear and then therapy has to be done with the child he or she has to undergo certain exercises in order to Uh, gain the balance and strength in the limbs so that they can stand on their own. Uh, the therapy that follows the usage of AFOs is called neurodevelopmental therapies. The various uh, props like that of the hydraulic ball and water is used to enhance the bodily capabilities of children with walking impairments. Uh, so, therefore, a sensitive intervention strategy. uh using both wheelchairs as well as uh, afos and neurodevelopmental therapy can promote well being of children with walking impairments however researches from technology society interface have uh, proven to us that technologies do not occur in vacuum rather their access to technologies and their impact on social populations are influenced by the complex workings of power the dreaming at the 
the core of unequal social relationships. It is against this backdrop that my paper has attempted to understand the perception of children with walking impairments and their parents towards the assistive technologies of wheelchair, AFOs, and neurodevelopmental therapy. The study of disability or impairment as a parameter of difference is futile if not studied in relation to other axes of inequalities like class, gender, religion, nationality, race, etc. So the intersectional lens uh, is added to the study in order to study the variations of experiences of children in terms of social class and gender. Coming to the methodology part, a mixed method research procedure has been used to uh, collect and analyze data in research. Primary data has been collected from 20 children having walking impairments belonging to the age group of 12 to 16 years and any one of their parents that is either the mother or the father. Uh, uh, out of 20 children, 10 children belong to upwardly mobile middle class groups and 10 children belong to uh, working class groups. And within the subsamples of class, there were five boy children and five girl children. That is five boy children and five girl children from uh, middle class groups and five boy children and five girl children from the working class groups. All the respondents were residents of Kolkata and all of them attended therapy sessions from the same therapist, uh, at least the same group of therapists. Uh, now coming to the data findings, I have seen that the very first point that I would like to elaborate is the a point of access to these technologies. Now an a, a average cost of an AFO is 8,000 rupees and that of a wheelchair is 7,000 rupees. And a neurodevelopmental therapy session, which amounts to one hour, costs about 600 rupees. So here, in terms of access, I have uh, realized and I have seen is that uh, class plays a decisive role in terms of access and gender takes a backseat. Because 90% of the middle class children had access to both of the technologies, that is both wheelchair as well as the AFOs and therapies, whereas only 60% uh, of the children from lower income groups had the AFOs and 40% had wheelchairs. Uh, also, 30% of the children from middle income groups had multiple AFOs. So that is not just one set of AFOs, they had one particular set for going to party, one particular set for going to school, and one particular set for going out to play, one particular set to uh, probably wear at home. So this is how access to different technologies differed. Uh, coming to the parents' perception, uh, parents from middle class backgrounds prioritized education of children equally in addition to giving access to uh, access to them about uh, with regard to these technologies parents from middle class backgrounds wanted their children to pursue therapy and as well as get enrolled in some special school or in some leisure activities whereas uh, parents from working class groups specifically focused on therapy so they would rather uh, skip out on education but would encourage therapy because they believe this would make help their children to become independent. Uh, they worked very hard to actually uh, fund the treatments of their children. Some father would, a father who works as a chauffeur would take up extra duties on Sunday. A mother who owns a tea stall would take up sewing work. And uh, most of the time when they are unable to attend the therapy sessions, because therapy sessions uh, cost 600 per session, so they would record the exercises and make their child do the exercises. Exercises at home. Uh, so, Annette Laurel in uh, Unequal Childhoods has referred to uh, what the middle class parents do is concerted cultivation, where they emphasize on engagement of their children into time specific, age specific organized activities. Whereas the working class parents have their caregiving strategies devised around accomplishment of physical growth. We can see a reflection of that over here. The next point that I want to highlight is the perception about the, these technologies. Onushua, please.
restrict to time limit yes sir yes sir i am concluding so perception regarding the perception of technologies i have seen that uh, around 80% of the children from middle class group said that they enjoyed wheelchair more than they enjoyed the air pools around 40% of children who had access to wheelchairs from lower income groups said that they enjoyed wheelchairs 60% of children from lower income groups who did not have access to wheelchairs but had a ride on a wheelchair while attending hospital or a clinic said that they enjoyed irrespective of class backgrounds all the children complained of pain and blisters in terms of ailments and the children actually uh, you know actively participated in choice of wheelchairs so i would like to show my last slide uh, where this is an unicorn themed wheelchair so this was sent to me by one of my respondents who is a you know, 13 year old girl belonging to a middle class family where she wants this particular unicorn themed wheelchair as her birthday gift and when i also interviewed another child from a lower income group he said that he has he doesn't have a wheelchair but he has friends who work as porters in the market and in the evening what happens is that they make him sit on the vegetable cart the cart that can travel from one place to another and they take him on a ride across the neighborhood which he really enjoys so this identification of the children with the technologies reflects uh, donna haraway cyborg where flesh and machine entangle in such a way that the boundaries between artificial and natural dissolve coming to my last point in terms of parents's perception here all so irrespective of class background all the parents wanted to highlight that they want their children to wear air force because air force they think will make their children walk on their own whereas wheelchair is only going to make them sit back and make them confined to the wheelchair so this entire idea of extracting normality out of the child is there in all parents irrespective of their class backgrounds i will cut short the narrative but it is very significant that i mention the narrative one of my respondents who is a 15 year old boy wants to pursue wheelchair cricket and he also told me he wants to see the taj mahal but he knows that taj, the interiors of taj mahal is not accessible to wheelchair users so he has to walk so he wears the air pool and he had exercised to such an extent that he has had blisters and those blisters got metamorphosed into wounds and needed the intervention of a plastic surgeon to heal the wounds so when i asked him why did you not complain of pain it must be pain he said that i would want to do that but you know i really want to see taj mahal and my father would always say that the interiors of taj mahal is something you should see and if you go near the taj mahal and click a picture sitting on a wheelchair then that will look very bad it's better you learn to stand and if you learn to stand you can play cricket normal cricket like virat kohli similar kind of a narrative i found when i interviewed a girl a girl's mother the girl wanted to pursue wheelchair dance because she saw that dance in india's got talent show and but the mother was reluctant that she would not actually even accept a donated wheelchair from any non profit organization because she told me that the the school that she attends the girl attends doesn't have any provision of wheelchair dance and also Uh, a young girl in a wheelchair doesn't look good so if we look into the perspective of post modern criminological theories then they have uh, i they have defined crime as uh, infliction of harm and there are two types of harm harms of repression and harms of reduction harms of reduction is where the victim is reduced from his personhood and harms of repression is when he is repressed and not allowed to become what he wants to become so this idea of the parents telling children that you know conclude you should at least conclude yes yes sir, yes sir. Uh, just one uh, this idea of parents telling their children that see you are a impaired person and you have to fit into normalcy reduces their uh, personhood and also 
this entire structural inequality of the historical places not being available for the impaired and no opportunities for pursuing uh, recreational activities like dance represses them and reduces them in a you know in a particular harming atmosphere i would skip the uh, part of gender if anybody wants i will uh, talk about it I, i would conclude by saying that this area is particularly neglected and there is a huge dearth of research but it demands exploration through academic research and interventions through political activism so all of us who are there in the child rights sector should come Uh, hand in hand and explore this place so that we can create an atmosphere where technologies help our children and not actually control them thank you so much thank you thank you thank you anushwa chandrabali are you here chandrabali hello apritha uh, please apritha yeah yes sir take over Yes, Shoma, Shoma, <coughs> Shoma, Principal Madam, yeah. please allow me to leave. Yes, ma'am, I'm here. I'm here. Uh, so you proceed. Uh, just urgent. I am so late, you know. So allow me to leave. Hello, uh, Shoma. Thank you, Shoma. sir. Thank you very much for your kind participation Thanks. and wonderful uh, job as a chairperson. Thank uh, you. Thank yeah, you. we are really privileged. Thank you. Shoma, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have some other presenters today. Uh, next, I would like to invite Smriti Uma Bishesh from uh, Saint Paul's Cathedral Mission College to deliver her paper. Madam, please uh, introduce yourself and uh, start your presentation. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, am I audible? Yes, yes. Please carry on. Uh, a very good evening to honorable uh, chairperson sir madam principal the organizing committee and all other distinguished members present today the title of my paper is locating the differently abled child in the context of indian family a critical study of mahesh dattani's bravely for the queen and tara i am uma vishash assistant professor department of english St Paul's Cathedral Mission College Kolkata The concept of family is often posited in literature as a haunted site where representation of fear is articulated through the members of different generations comprising of individuals who are persecuted by personal anxieties and also can be regarded as repositories of collective mentalities haunted by the cultural ghosts This is more so in the Indian context where the family is often subjected to a repressive system which uncannily demands to maintain the superficial gloss of decorum respectability and etiquette functioning within a rigid patriarchal setup given this context the child often becomes the emblematic victim of familial crimes and deceptions My paper intends to explore the study of childhood in the light of this reading. In doing so, I shall focus on two case studies of the portrayal of differently abled children in affluent urban-based Indian families as presented in the Tani's plays Bravely for the Queen and Tara respectively. Both these plays present the disabled child, incidentally both of them being girl child as victims of gender Uh, sorry gender discriminations crimes and traumas that are perpetuated within the claustrophobic environment uh, of the supposedly civilized housing thereby exposing the hypocrisy of the bourgeois household from the point of the child the plays present fears revolving around images of confinement of exclusion and abandonment that meet and merge in a tangled psychodrama of which the parental abode is the characteristic stage set the tanis place tara and bravely fought the queen expose the fact that the trope of the family is fundamentally an ideological construct designed to both embody and protect the status authority and secrets of the privileged individuals 
the play tara dramatizes the emotional separation of two conjoined twins and the manipulation of their mother and grandfather to favor the boy child over the girl child as a result tara is left crippled for the rest of her life the whole play thus revolves around the bitter truth of child abuse that prevails in indian societies Significantly, the whole traumatic past of Tara is gradually revealed to us through a guilt-ridden narrative by Chandan, Tara's male counterpart. Several issues are being addressed over here. Gender discrimination, sexism, and hypocrisy are all examined through this disturbing narrative that upsets the idea of the traditional concept of the home. the parental residence which may seem safe and comforting to the child in comparison to the menacing outside world increasingly becomes vulnerable and its protective enclosures tend to breed not so much security as anxiety moreover the dark suppressed secret of the genealogy is resurfaced through the transgenerational haunting as is evident from chandan's narrative The theme of familial repression is hence resorted to by the Tani in order to foreground infantile exploitation by the adult world where generational and gender politics becomes closely interrelated. A major way of keeping at bay the anxieties posed by children is to forsake the child by making them feel alienated within the familial structure more so if the child is differently abled. This is evidenced by the fact that Daksha, the crippled child of the Trivedi family, is never spoken of in the public, especially by the father, whose infliction of physical violence on his pregnant wife had resulted in the premature birth of the disabled child. She is rather symbolically associated with the bonsai plant. a metaphor for grotesqueness thus undermining her failure to conform to the notion of corporeal unity insistently promoted by the dominant discourse and hence relegating her to a fringed existence the frequent instance of the girl child as being the most likely candidate for persecution is partly a corollary to the issue of gender relations that operate in the indian families while corrupt patriarchs are most often the principal perpetrators of violence and child abuse sometimes the mothers both biological and adoptive insistently prove as obnoxious as the patriarchs themselves this is evident from the fact that in both the plays it is the mother figure who had been responsible for the tragedy of the children it was tara's mother's decision that the extra leg should be given to the boy child and daksha's physical disability was the result of the ignominious deed of the child's grandmother provoking her son to hit his pregnant wife moreover it should also be noted that in both cases the differently abled girl child is confined and rendered to an exile within the domain of the domestic household This is so because the bourgeois commitment to an architectural code of comfort, privacy, and control go hand in hand with a hypocritical celebration of women's power by confining them to the claustrophobic environment of the supposedly civilized housing. Whereas Chandan, Tara's twin brother, although suffering a similar tragic fate, is asked to join the office. This shows that children are invariably subjected to a process of socialization demanded by the family without taking into consideration the child's special needs to conform to the adult world. The Tani therefore in making the child the emblematic victim of familial crimes and deceptions suggests that the idea of family as an all-powerful impermeable conglomerate based on the ideas of unity integrity safety and shelter is vulnerable to evil intrusions that threaten to disrupt its protective aura it is equally pertinent to note over here that it is not only the poor destitute and abandoned children who suffer a tragic and uncertain future but even the children of the privileged upper class bourgeois household are equally threatened more so 
because the bourgeois demands of maintaining the decorum and respectability of the traditional household would make the adult world contentedly brush aside all these issues under the carpet, leaving the children no choice but to negotiate with the crimes and traumas that their parental abode secret and labor vainly against their fate within a framework of domestic perverseness and misappropriated power. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Srimati Uma Vishash, for such wonderful presentation. And uh, now I would like to invite on a Mitra Ghosh and Onupam Devnath for their presentation. And, and that is the last presentation for today's session. So may I please request Onamitra Ghosh and Onupam Devnath? Onamitra Ghosh and Onupam Devnath? Yes. A very good evening to everyone. Uh, my name is Onamitra Ghosh. Uh, uh, I, I would like to start a PPT presentation. Uh, please hold for a second. Anamitra, please introduce yourself, okay? okay. Uh, a very good evening to everyone. My name is Anamitra Ghosh. Uh, I am a PhD research scholar at the Department of Sociology at Presidency University. Uh, a very good evening to all the professors, chairpersons, principal, and all the presenters. So uh, I would be sharing a PPT. Uh, there seems to be some technical problem. Uh, I will just read out my PPT. Please one second. Uh, my topic is examining the influences of gender stereotyping on child care. The case of uh, leisure practices of the children of urban caregivers in West Bengal. Okay, so uh, the gendered aspect of care caregiving comes to play when we accept the connotation that gender socialization leads to specific threads of identity constructions that are imbued by different social structures bearing on specific locations and contexts. The specific choices which are exercised by children belonging to these families stems from the wider discourse of gender socialization, which is the process by which children learn the cultural, uh, culture related norms and expectations of their family members. Okay, now this presentation, uh, my paper would uh, like to provide a sociological account of the processes of the parenting practices of the children belonging to urban caregiving families of Bengal that is represented through the choices of leisure preferences in city space. So the preferences of leisure among children is implicated through a symbolic construction of gender identities that come into play through the varied definitions of child care that these families provide. So sociologists often conceive gender stereotyping as part of the processes of a parenting practice by which children are socialized into sex roles and by which adults and children are denied opportunities for more individually varied development. So my paper in this slide is, uh, would try to focus on whether these stereotypes as one-sided and exaggerated images of men and women are deployed repeatedly in everyday life in the different mechanisms of child care that gets reflected in the leisure preferences of children. So the caregiver families whom I've interviewed live mostly in one room flats that have, that have been built immediately beside the garage space in the ground floor of the large ap apartment buildings of the locality. So there's a sharp difference which exists between a caregiver 
and a caretaker in terms of their labor performativity and interaction in everyday life. But the sole responsibility of the caretaker is to provide social security to the building or land. The caregiver's responsibility, by contrast, is to provide emotional support to their employers. So, so there can be no clear line of demar demarcation that can be made between work and leisure time for the caregivers. What can usually be conceived as work and leisure hours for the children is ultimately a gamble that is indeed circumspect of the nature of the job that their parents are uh, needed to do as care managers. So this contractual and transitory nature of this work demands that their parents should be in duty all of the time so as not to break the trust that fits so well with the employer's satisfaction of needs and most importantly, of course, the providence of emotional security. So there's an emerging contradiction that exists in terms of the labor participation uh, for the caregivers, as in many cases it is found that the attendant processes of gender, pro uh, as the attendant processes of the gender labor results in the paucity of time for looking after their children, uh, own children's needs. So uh, my paper, uh, my, my study has, uh, in my study, I've conducted in-depth interviews of both parents and children uh, from six families in the month of February. Uh, interview schedules were also used to measure the influences of gender socialization in parenting practices through the use of several indicators as self-autonomy, attribution, home discipline, friendship bonding, and intrinsic motivation. So I'll give one narrative account of uh, one of the children I've interviewed. Uh, her, her name is Shornali Moitro. Now, Shornali, Shornali Moitro is a 12-year-old girl from Midnapur. Her family has moved to Kolkata in 2010. Her mother has committed suicide after they have come to Kolkata, although there was no family conflict. Five years after her father married again, and they have now a second, second girl child. Shonali studies in class six in Lagunrod Bidapit for girls in Labuni estate. Her family pastime, her favorite pastime is drawing and playing with Ludo and Karam, which are popular Bengali games. And uh, her father works at the construction labor in a factory of Kolkata. He also works as a caretaker in part in, in, uh, in Uber driving agency, which supplies taxis to the help of taxi building apps. During winter time, Shonani plays badminton with her friends on the street, but she does not get to, uh, like to go to the park. This goes on to show that how the life in urban Kolkata has changed for the conservative lower middle class Bengali families who would hesitate to, chill, uh, uh, to send their children to parks because of safety reasons. Thus, sending children to play in the parks is no longer an everyday affair for children of the lower class Bengali families. So there was another case study uh, of a boy named Shushaban who is age, who is 14 years uh, who was 14 years old and who belonged to a lower middle class family Bengali family from Mushidabad. His family moved to Kolkata in 2011, where his father got employment in a housing construction site in Kolkata. In, at a later date, he also got engaged in the KT premises of a metropolitan town in Kolkata. His father used to be a farmer who at a village, farmer at a village and worked day and night to support their family. When they came to Kolkata with his family, uh, he got admitted to Acharya Prafulla Chandra High School, high school in GC block. So, uh, uh, Shushabon likes to pass participate in many of the cultural programs conducted in his school. Since both his parents work for almost all the entire day for earning their daily wages, he's obligated to look after the house at their absence. So there is some routine course that he has to perform, like washing the plates in the, uh, washing the plants in the garden, cleaning up the furniture, and also the floor of the house and wiping out the walls. 
So, uh, this uh, Onamitra, may I please interrupt once? Yes, please. Uh, uh, please try to wind up in another two to three minutes. Okay. Because we are running uh, short of time. Okay. Onupam, can you please continue? Hello? Uh, can everyone hear me? Hello? Yes, you are audible. Yes, you uh, carry on. Yes. You are audible. Yes, so my name is Onupam Devnath. I am a PhD scholar of Social Work Department of Vishwabharati University. So I think Piali Ma'am and Onamito has actually exclusively focused on this leisure aspect and how it uh, uh, influences gender socialization and gender stereotyping, everything. So I just want, I have taken just one uh, case study. So I just want to uh, share that. So, so as Onamito has said that because of the caregivers are so engaged in catering to the needs of the urban middle uh, and upper class families, they hardly find enough time to listen to what their children has to say. So in my case, what leisure meant for the particular girl who studies in CIT Bagmari school in Kakurgachi was out of the other, out of the so many domains uh, of uh, perceptual domains of leisure, we find that freedom of choice and enjoyment. Freedom of choice and enjoyment is what she means by leisure, not intrinsic motivation, relaxation, or lack of evaluation, as Susan uh, Shaw in her paper has uh, highlighted. So what I found is that the when I interviewed her, so the her mother, who was the caregiver, uh, her husband died four years ago due to snake bite in Sundarban, and she has uh, two daughters and one son. Uh, since her father and her brother is completely financially dependent on her, so she has to work very hard to make these both ends meet. And therefore, she is unable to give enough time to her daughter and to even understand what uh, leisure means to her daughter and how she is participating in those leisure activities. So what she does is she watches TV. Uh, she mainly watches Motu Paglu, plays Ludo. She does not watch movies or TV serials because her mother watches TV serials, which is for uh, around half an hour a day. And whole day she has to go for school and for tuition. So she does not get enough time. She only uh, gets uh, half an hour to one hour time for her leisure activities. And, uh, and uh, what I found is that, so in majority of the cases, the urban poor uh, working ch class children, they do not go to park for their safety issues, which their parents say. But at the actual reason is that uh, because the, uh, the children who belong from the middle class and upper uh, families, they, they, have the, they have the ability to buy the uh, expensive equipments to play, for, to play, like for example, cricket, you need the helmet, you need the pads. But for these children, they don't have that. So they don't uh, play in the park. They don't go to the play center of shopping malls which is uh, another contrast. If we look at the intersection of class and gender socializations, then this is another contrast. And also, uh, unlike the uh, middle and the upper class children, these children also do not opt for packaged food because it is not an option for them. So this is what I have found. And, uh, and so we can conclude that, I mean, though it was just a preliminary study and a lot needs to be explored, so we can say for the time being that the cases that we have started to explore uh, shows that gender stereotyped images of men and women are iterated and reiterated uh, through child care practices by their caregivers, which in a way partly structure the leisure preferences of their children, which in turn partly reinforce the gender stereotype in the process of their gender socialization. The reason why I'm saying partly is because there is resistance. So from the from the uh, agency of the children, so they they also want something. Their parents, when they go to the malls, these uh, children of the middle and upper class children, they their parents while they do the shopping, they uh, put their kids in the play uh, play centers. So that provides a kind of reward for these children. So they kind of get the enjoyment and think that is our leisurely activities through which we are enjoying. Uh, but which is not the case in case of uh, the urban poor working class children. So in case of they, them, what I have observed, there is a bit of resistance. So this is uh, what we would like to conclude. Thank you for your patient hearing. Thank you so much, Onamitra and Jonupam, uh, for throwing light on such a significant issue. 
and uh, now i would like to uh, request shantan ghosh faculty of sociology hiralal muzumdar memorial college for women to uh, deliver the vote of thanks for this session formally once again shantan please carry on thank you chandravali ji uh, so finally we had had a excellent day of seminar very enlightening uh, talks from all of our speakers i would like to thank our formal speakers i would like to thank professor anuruddh choudhury for chairing the session thank you sir you have you have always been an inspiration i would like to thank the presenters professor sreemrutu mukherjee you have touched on upon various issues during the end you, you were also mentioning about foco and childhood construction thank you for that uh, thank you to uh, professor uma bishash for she was mentioning uh, uh, the construction of identities and so on and so forth issue of alienation very interesting uh, talk thank you to onusha maitra i think i have listened to you previously it's very uh, intriguing very enlightening to listen from you hope to listen from you again in the future and thank you to onamitra and onupam uh, uh, it's they are known to me also and very good presentations you are working on caregivers and their children uh, th excellent presentations all of them and finally a formal vote of thanks to all of all of our part participants uh, thank you to the organizer i mean our principal soma ghosh for her support and all the team hmmcw we work as a family and hope to see you on tomorrow again thanks to all of you and we hope that we will also have a great day seminar tomorrow also thanks to all of you over to you chandravali ji yeah thank you so we will meet again tomorrow at 4 pm and uh, i hope all have got the link for uh, tomorrow's session so kindly join tomorrow at 4 uh, we will have a wonderful session tomorrow also we can hope to have a wonderful session till then goodbye to all of you and thank you so much